Good morning, everyone. I thank you and welcome you to our Empowered Caregivers Forum. I am Carla Lewis, the founder of Kids Conquering Sickle Cell Disease Foundation. And here I have with me is Ray Blaylord, my, Blaylord, my, my partner in crime, sickle cell warrior mom, and CEO and founder of Sickle Cell Foundation of Minnesota. And I just wanted to just join in today. I thank you for being here. We have developed this great community resource for us uh, forum so we can talk and be very just um, transparent about resources. We want to make sure the community is able to connect in a positive way and be able to ask the, the necessary questions we need as caregivers, um, warriors, and just um, health professionals in the community. So I welcome you today. And um, just for our icebreaker, I am, um, since we have a few people that have joined in right now, I want to um, start just something, something interesting that we can just tell about ourselves. So I'm gonna start, I would like to you to use a letter in your name and just explain, just say something, one of the letters, how one of those letters describe you. And I'm gonna use, I'll start first. Um, for Carla, compassionate. Um, I'm compassionate about sickle cell. I am compassionate about rare disease. And I feel that um, what we do and, and how we um, navigate our lives in, through our experiences, we can use those things to help others. And I have done that with my journey. So I just want to be able to share my compassion continuously with others as I share resources. And I have a heart for those that, are, are, that battle chronic illnesses. So I will have next for Ray to go. And then Ray, you can choose somebody. Okay, good morning, everybody. I am so happy to be here. We are so looking forward to this time with you and all the uh, resources that we'll share with you. And um, for mine, um, Ray, I'm gonna use the R for resilient. And this journey has taught me resilience. Early on in this journey, um, it felt overwhelming at times and I didn't, there were days I didn't know how I would go on, but I made it through the next day and each day I found that the next day was uh, uh, even easier and never, the, 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 the challenges didn't always disappear, but the resilience got stronger. And so I consider that one of my greatest strengths, resilience. And I'm going to choose Sarai next. I'm going to start with my letter S. That means superstar. I'm always a superstar in the community. I'm always an activist and an artist, as well as a dancer and as a singer. I'm always going to be a superstar for sickle cell, no matter what happens in life. I understand we fall down, we get up. But as we know, I got to continue to be the superstar for the community. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And um, next, we will have Shirley. Miller. Okay, I'll start with the S in my name also. And I'm going to say supportive. Um, I've been in sickle cell advocacy for many, many years, 20 plus years. And I think that I've been supportive in every area of sickle cell. I've done um, lobbying. I've done uh, support in um, sickle cell comprehensive centers. I've been on sickle cell grants. I've been in uh, uh, just about everything. So that's what mine is, S for support. Nice, nice. And then we will go to Joan. Good morning. I'm going to use J uh, from my name and I'm going to um, use the word joyful because <laughs> I am a very I feel like I'm a very joyous person and I get a lot of satisfaction and a lot of joy, quite honestly, out of working with people like yourselves that are trying to make this world a better place for those that um, are living with sickle cell disease, so. Thank you, thank you. And then we'll have Ramona. Oh, hi everyone, um, I'll go with M in my name. 
And I would like to say I'm motivated, motivated to learn more about like sickle cell and the different way it impacts and influences the daily lives of individuals. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And now we'll have Francesca. Hi everyone. Um, I will go with the O in my name for optimistic. And I'm optimistic that there will be more research on sickle cell disease and not just how it affects the individual with the disease, but the primary caregivers and the family members. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then next we'll have Milda. Good morning, everyone. So I will say A, which is um, I'm animated. So <laughs> many people are not aware, but everything I I see or do is kind of translated into some type of picture. And um, even when I meet persons, it's, I form a different character, um, but definitely animated. Um, and it goes towards my personal living space, my advocacy. It is, there is, you can do so much. There's not a limit to anything you do. And I feel when we watch um, cartoons and we see art, um, we find out about a person's story um, when we are able to research why an artist had drawn a certain picture. And I feel that is the, the, the word that best describes me for persons that know me personally. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for joining us. And now we have Dr. Weir that's here and joining up, which is our present speaker. So I will allow you, Dr. Weir, to describe a letter in your name and I would like to read your, a little bit about your bio. So um, give you an introduction. <laughs> I caught you off guard, but um, I'll just use scene for, um, for compassion. Um, like to just, that's all the work I've ever done has been about compassion towards the cell community. Um, me, me being a carrier myself as well, I'm um, being affected by the disease. I just have compassion for everyone that's in this community um, and just wanted to continue to, to do the work to, um, to help heal. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us also. So I'm going to read a little bit about Dr. Ware. Dr. Ware is an authoritative international lecturer and researcher of her re-owned who has who has developed wellness programs for several Fortune 500 companies. The former C C senior VP of biologics and director to one of the leading health and beauty companies in America. <clears throat> he is a trusted US representative to the National Coalition to, for Good Govern Governance of Nigeria. Dr. Ware has worked with several companies as a product developer. Dr. Charlie Ware, is a natural pain management and orient and genic specialist. He even wears a white coat from time to time, but that's where his com com that's where his conformance for to the norm ends. Dr. Weir has made a career out of achieving what seems impossible with unlazy, calm, and empathetic humor. I would love to just um, speak a little bit on Dr. Weir's compassion for the community and um, his development um, and, and founder of Healing Blends, um, which um, he pretty much is that um, compassionate, um, not only um, person that have come to the community and decided that there, there needs to be something, but there needs to also be health awareness in our community and what we can do to adapt healthy habits. So I have invited Dr. Ware because it's so important for us as a community to not only understand what resources are available to us, but understand how our body works um, with natural products and what we can do in order to help ourselves, whether fighting a chronic illness or not. It's so important that what we achieve by what we eat is helping to build our system. So um, I gravitated to Dr. Weir and, and everything that he is doing um, pretty much in order to emphasize 
on health because that's so important, especially for our community that's challenged with battling pain as well as a chronic illness such as sickle cell and other rare diseases. So Dr. Ware, I welcome you. Thank you for being here. Um, do, um, do you have any slides that you would like us to share? Actually, no, I, I apologize. Okay. I, I typically don't uh, do slides, for, it's okay. just, it's, it's my thing. I just like to, to give the information and sort of go with it um, as well. But um, I, I, I can send links later on to some of the dietary recommendations that um, I, I, I'll be telling you about. Um, we have them on our site as well as, and I, I give really to different individuals. I have slides for, I mean, I have um, uh, diet for, you know, and inflammatory responses, uh, smoothies and things that are sort as well. So I'll send all that stuff over to you in an email so you can, you can send out to the group as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let me jump into it. Yes. All right, great, great. So thank you so much uh, for actually having me on. And um, I know this community that, um, and I love, you know, jumping on to hear some of the, uh, the, the letters, their name, because it was giving me an opportunity to see who was on board, and and, and knowing some of the individuals have been like you know I'll call them pioneers um, in the sickle cell community and, and huge advocates for for years and years and years. So I thank them for also being on board, but also um, just the work that they've done over the, the last I say decades, you know, um, and and it's, it's totally amazing. Um, the purpose of, of my lecture today, realistically, is you know, as Ms. Lewis said, it was really is 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 not just about the natural life. It's really about understanding how one food um, and lifestyle modifications can really make a huge difference inside of your life. Uh, I, I know Ms. Lewis was having some issues with uh, some of the words that um, they were on my my bio, but um, what I I actually um, I'm a functional medicine um, doctor. I do things from a natural standpoint, but also I have a fellow in genetics and also epigenetics. What does that really mean? People always ask me, what does it mean to, to, to do epigenetics? But epigenetics is really about understanding all the things um, in someone's life that control the gene expression. So I've been doing that for the last six years um, in my practice, um, where in my practice, well, I do a lot of telemed as well. So this is how the development of a a lot of different uh, treatment protocols, where, where, whether it be chronic disease um, towards uh, sickle cell disease or diabetes, whatever it is, we've been able to, to deduce down, you know, essentially what really controls the expression of a lot of, of these genes. You know, whether you're born with, you know, a variance, as we call it, to have diabetes or to have Alzheimer's disease or even to have sickle cell disease, there are ways to, to really control some of your eating habits, some of your lifestyle modifications where the expression isn't going to be as rampant um, as we think it is. And I, I, I'll share some of the research um, uh, from that as well. So let me jump into it uh, a little bit deeper. So we already know that you know most individuals are born with anywhere between 10 and 14 different chronic diseases encoded in our DNA, right? So this is just part of, of our genetic response just to just from genes being passed from person to person to person. Um, but um, what it largely we uh, believe in our population is the fact that, okay, well, my mom and dad has diabetes or hypertension or whatever it is, so I'm gonna eventually get it. And we found that that is only a, a true in the case, about 8% of the cases that if your parents have a particular disease, you're going to have it. And the way that we've been able to, to, to sort of like modify that or even see that was through the lifestyles that we choose to li um, live. So say for instance, you know, um, I'm from the country, I was born in Virginia, you know, lived on a farm, small town, things of that sort. So for years, you know, the only thing I knew, um, to, it's funny because I, I tell the story, I was just home recently. I was like, I said, mom, do you recall the first time I, I actually saw a chicken in a pack, like, like a packaged chicken? She was like, yeah, you're like eight years old and you were asking what was this, you know, because we had our, our own chicken and goats and pigs all these, all these weird things. Ate, our, you know, ate farm fresh eggs, didn't know what that was because we just went to the chicken because we got them. So, you know, seeing some other disease that there was a rise in my family later on in life when we actually moved away from the actual farm, you know, my grandfather died when he was 87 years old, still riding his bicycle every day. He, he had one missing tooth and had one little patch of, of all a spot in his hair. He was Native American from a travel for quote, but he lived off the land all his life. Conversely, mm -hmm. my grandmother who um, was uh, half Native American, what she did was she chose to do the packaging, you know, things. Um, they actually, um, the, the divorce early uh, on, on, 
you know, in my life. But, um, and she gained, I mean, um, like Graham's gained like 75 pounds and she was overweight and she um, subsequently died of um, like a stroke, you know, and I've had three aunts die of strokes because they actually chose that lifestyle. We look at the individuals, even in my family that chose to live a more, you know, holistic um, lifestyle, you know, no one's on medications and things of that sort. So even in my own family, I was able to just digest, well, if I eat a certain way, I'm gonna feel a certain way as well. You know, and then even with the science, we've been able to actually see that, you know, that, you know, like I said, 8% of, of the case is gonna be true that, but 80% of our lifestyle really dictate, dictates how our, uh, our, our expression of disease and our actually absorption of, of, of disease is really going to be the actual paramount thing that we have to really look at. And what is lifestyle? Lifestyle is really sleep, is stress management, and yes, it is diet, okay? So many individuals forget that sleep is so, 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 so important. And why do I even start with sleep? I start with sleep because of the fact that most individuals, you know, have a have a television in their room or have their, their their iPad or laptop in their bed before they actually go to sleep. That's actually has been shown to actually decrease the rate of healing up to 85%. And why is that happening? Because of the fact that your brain responses to that blue light or that brain responses to the to, to the EMFs um, that's being emitted from those devices is actually causing the brain not to actually relax and allow you to get to a deeper sleep. So by not allowing your body to even get to a deeper sleep, you're not actually detoxing the body from a naturalistic standpoint. So what actually happens is right here, every night we produce something called beta amyloid. Beta amyloid is a plaque that our brain produces because we think we, 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 we do processes. Our brain works and every process in the body has a, a, a byproduct of waste in some sort of way. And that beta amyloid is that plaque. So essentially it takes between six and eight hours for your body to really detoxify all this beta amyloid off the brain itself. So what actually happens is we've shown that individuals who are not sleeping in efficient seven to nine hours a night have a higher response for uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, diabetes, inflammatory disease, all these things because of the fact that our body is not allowing our brain to rest and get the proper detoxification uh, application it naturally needs. So that's one. And then two, we look at the fact that, you know, we're not allowing our bodies to rest and repair itself. This is where our body actually, if you look at it from a gastrointestinal standpoint, we're not allowing our bodies to even break down the food and actually utilize the food the proper way. Because essentially when you're sleeping, that's when your body actually breaks down all of the proteins, all of the carbohydrates, and actually turns them into the proper nutrients we're supposed to have on a daily basis. Almost all the vitamins that we actually are supposed to have in our body comes from our food, correct? And if we're not allowing our body to actually properly digest that and break it down and send it to where it's supposed to be, what's going to happen? Malnutrition. You're going to start producing more mucus inside the gut. You're going to start actually reducing the gastrointestinal uh, 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 just absorption rate. And then you're going to start to actually have that, oh, early morning, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, or I don't feel like eating at all. And why? Because your body's like, I can't eat because I have not finished doing my job as of yet. So that's, that's just one thing just with sleep that most individuals just, just do not understand that sleep is so utterly important, not just because of the fact that it's your beauty rest, but it's where your body truly, truly heals and really gets a, a reset on, on the day for a better day the next day as well. So that's why I tell everyone that if you're, if, if you're not doing these two things in your bedroom, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong. I always tell people, your bedroom is designed for two things. And we're all adults here, so I'll go ahead and say it. It's designed for sleep and for sex. That's what your bed is designed for. It's not designed for, for you to have your, your, your laptop or your, your iPad or any of these devices inside there. When it's time for you lay in your bed, you're supposed to actually then give your body this signal and say, hey, it's time to go to sleep and get a really good sleep so I can actually de de detoxify my body and rebuild all those systems up on a naturalistic standpoint. Right. So, so I, I tell all my patients, all my, my, my clients that I see all over the world, if you have a television in your room, if you have it mounted on the wall, take it off. I'm sorry. Get some, put some putty, some paint and paint over that, but take them out. None of my devices are in my bedroom. 
Um, if, if someone needs to call me in an emergency, I have a landline, they actually call me on, but all my devices, when they're charging, they're in you know, the kitchen, which is the, all the way across the, on the other side of the house. Uh, and because the, the, the reason why is because I wanna make sure that my body is going to get the best sleep I can get so I can repair and rest my body so I can be good for the next day, okay? So that's one. So this um, um, get from, you know, I said sleep, and I say stress management, the, the, the crazy thing with stress management is no one feels as if they're stressed out unless they're, oh, I have a stressful job or whatever. But stress isn't just, you know, the, the physical, emotional stress. It's also oxidative stress that we're also looking at. So essentially, whatever you're eating is going to cause either oxidative stress or either nutrients so you can combat oxidative stress. So one thing we have to really look at, and this is a bridge to also the diet as well, Say, for instance, you're not eating the proper amount of omega-3 oils, and that's huge. So it's like olive oil, coconut oil, things of that sort. If you're not eating that, you're causing oxidative stress inside your body. And what does that do to the actual um, cell itself is actually degrading the cell. And a lot of the cell to break down a lot faster inside the body. If you don't have the proper amount of omega oils inside your system and some other uh, uh, phytonutrients, what happens is that oxidative stress just keeps circulating around inside the body. Those broken cells keep circulating around, uh, circulating around inside the body. So again, it's so important for you to understand that just, just stress management for as far as like eating, as far as your thought process is so important because again, there's a gene called TNF. It's, it's tumor necrotic factor um, gene one, two, and five, whatever. It's a gene, but it's also there are different uh, chemicals inside the, inside the cell that actually have this as well. Those are designed to actually kill any sort of tumor making processes. So we want to make sure that we are able to activate all, all, all these processes by actually having the proper diet as well. But if you're continually eating like these bad fats, these bad sugars and things that to it, your body is just gonna start to build this up and won't have the ability to actually fight it. Because a lot of those processes, the enzymes are turned off when you're not one sleeping well and you talks about in your body. And then two, we not allowing yourself to really manage your stress more efficiently. So I tell uh, a lot of my, my clients, the first thing you want to do before you even go to sleep is stretch and meditate or pray and or pray. I, you know, I do all three. And the reason why you want to calm down your mind, you want to calm down your body, you want to get into a good space where your body is saying, hey, okay, I'm ready to rest, relax and heal. And it's as simple as just doing some simple stretches. I'm not saying go out and do yoga or whatever. Just do some simple stretch and touching your toes, you know, doing some trunk some twists. Little small things like that has been shown from a research standpoint to calm the body down enough where your body is ready to actually rest, relax, and actually fight any sort of disease inside the body. And the reason why meditation and prayer is so important because then you're controlling your breathing. You know, something that's called uh, um, HRT, uh, heart rate therapy, whatever. But, you know, what, what that really is about is really is you should not be breathing no more than like eight to 10 times per minute per breath. So essentially what's actually happening is, um, I'm sorry, but, um, but, but per heartbeat. So what actually happens is when you start to look at how many times you are breathing within a minute, most individuals are around 16 or 20 to 24. That means you're actually breathing too fast. You're letting too much carbon dioxide sort of build up in your system. And that carbon dioxide is also creating a lot of inflammation and oxidative stress on your body, right? And again, notice I'm not even mentioning anything like emotional stress and job stress. This is all stress that we can control just by eating, just by breathing, just by meditating, just by relaxing our own bodies. So on a daily basis, I you know always stretch. I'll always take three or four deep, deep breaths, you know, in between patients or before I get on the phone to anyone. That's caused my body, and my mind to say, hey, look, hey, there's no trick here. Yes, relax and get into a relaxed state. So we can have a conversation with someone about their own health as well. So the same practice I try to teach many individuals too. So that sleep, that stress management, and then we're going to start to look at the diet. Yes, the diet is the most important thing that we can actually do to control any sort of uh, disease in our system. It's been largely like sort of poo-pooed and, and, and looked upon, oh, well, you know, diet is not that important. Now all the research comes out, it's like diet is the most important thing, is the most important thing. Why is this? It's because of the fact that we, we see that it's not about being vegan. It's not about you know having a keto diet. It's not about any of those things. It's about actually on a daily basis, eating the right amount of protein, eating the right amount of carbohydrates, 
and uh, getting the micro and macronutrients inside your system. And also, as I already referred to, again, those healthy fats. Those healthy fats are what's important for the body to really use that fat as being fuel. Before we largely thought it was, you know, sugars and glucose that was the only fuel that our body needed. Now we really see that it's the healthy fats the body uses to combat inflammation, to actually build other um, processes. We need this actual fat as a prebiotic to actually break down some of the things to turn the body, um, turn food into probiotics that our body really needs a good bacteria as well. So the whole, whole spectrum that we really have to look at when it comes to the actual diet itself. So I always get people say, so what's the best diet? I said food, food, clean, healthy, real food. If you're eating a lot of packaged food or eating out a whole lot, I say, please stop doing that. Figure out ways where you can make things more convenient for yourself. I get a question always about protein. Where are you, Dr. Where you, you, you said you're vegan. I say, yes, I'm vegan because it works for me. I know how to do this and be very, very healthy with it. I've been vegan or vegetarian for the last 30 plus years, and I haven't had any issues with it as of yet. I check my, my, my body mass. I check my, my muscle tone, things that sort. I've been pretty good, but my, a lot of individuals can't do it. So what I say, eat the right meats that's for you. Largely, if you eat chicken, fish, and actually um, turkey, you can have a little bit of, of red meat here and there. I just tell individuals to stay away from pork only because of the fact that in a lot of the commercial pork, you'll find little parasites here and there inside of it. And what those parasites do is actually they can lay dormant inside of your, your actual gut. And I've had quite a few individuals that have had to have parasite cleanses and detoxification or even medication for parasites inside their gut. So I say stay away from the from pork um, unless you raise it yourself and you know it was you actually feed your pig. But the fish, the chicken, and also the actual turkey or lean meats that you can actually just eat for you to digest, eat for you to purchase. And of course, make sure it is grass fed or as organic as you can afford. I think that the other thing that, that we largely um, uh, get confused, we're thinking that by eating healthy and eating natural food is so expensive. Um, years ago, I actually, I did a presentation for, a presentation for NIH and I was able to actually compare prices to packaged foods and, 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 the, and the sad diet, the standard American diet versus actually eating at home and just eating just natural food. I'm not, all, I'm not saying everything has to be organic, but if you go in and get a pack of chicken uh, and, and some rice and, and some broccoli and things like that, so it's a lot cheaper for you, for you to feed your family on that versus going out and getting these packaged things that you think is cheaper, but again, it's full of sodium, full of all these other bad things, and it doesn't last a very, very long as well. So we've been able We've been able to prove over and over again that it's so important for you to actually just eat real food, to eat a real piece of chicken that you actually season at home. A lot of our seasons has things inside of it um, with MSG and, 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 and these bad salts and these bad uh, um, sugars as well. And why do, why do I even bring in MSG, monosodium glutenate? Back to looking at genes is, is a, the actual glutamic acid we actually look at, and a lot of people uh, assume that they are allergic to to to, um, to it's actually the rate of glutamic acid that's in, inside of a food that really dictates how much inflammation is going to release inside the body. So when, when I look at MSG and things of that sort. I'm like, you got to make sure you're not eating these bad preservatives. What occurs is it causes so much more inflammation inside the body as well. And actually recently, it was a genetic study that was done um, by the mi a microbiome showing how a lot of these, these dyes, these preservatives, red dye number 40 and yellow dye number five and you know, all these big things, those were the precursors to IBD disease, which is irritable bowel disease. So, I mean, so, 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 so essentially, um, individuals who did not have these dyes inside their system, they didn't respond as, as harshly to uh, um, any sort of gut issues than individuals that were eating a lot of these packaged goods. So just by having these packaged goods and having these preservatives, um, the, the sort of be uh, benzene, things that are, sort of actually causes the actual uh, um, uh, leaky gut to actually occur in a lot of individuals, which means that you're producing more mucus and things of that sort. So it's been largely shown that these packaged goods are not good for us, guys. Um, another thing that packaged goods usually have in it is going to be that uh, um, the um, oh my gosh the, the high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup has been shown to do three things inside the body: not just produce inflammation because we already know that, but it actually has been shown to actually reduce brain function up by up to thirty-five percent for over two hours just by you having one bite of it. It's so much information. This, you can find this in PubMed. It also actually, it, 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 like once you ingest it in your body, sort of, you know, trying to get rid of it, 
once you, um, the different processes that have, have been attached to different enzymes, it actually turns into uh, almost like shards of glass. So they're actually leaving, you know, little trace uh, injuries inside of the body over and over and over again because it's not able to be used fully, just like regular sugar. It is not the proper um, type of sugar inside your body. So the inflammation, the, the brain function, and also the fact that it's causing internal damage is there one reason why you'll want to stop looking at you know all these things, stop having the, the artificial sugars and things of that sort. Artificial sugars, you know, back in the seventies, it was shown to actually cause brain cancer, not just in mice but also in humans and things of that sort. So it's shown to actually um, create you know havoc on the microbiome. The microbiome is where our body sort of you know, converts all of our food into different you know uh, hormones or or tra uh, uh, trace nutrients and things of that sort. But also that, that's where our immunity of our immunity actually is in our gut. If you have a bad microbiome, you can't fight anything, you know, at all, at all. You know, so so that's one reason why I take take my time and we look at things from a genetic standpoint. And then I, I do things from an actual standpoint because I'm like I'm trying to make sure that the body is gonna heal itself as natural as possible. I never have ever like poo-poo, you know, the, the whole Western mindset. What I say is how can we work together? How can we bridge those gaps and use the proper medications that won't cause as much harm, but then also use the natural things that's going to actually help, you know, alleviate a lot of the side effects as well. So it's always about bridging gaps and things that are so so, um, and actually, um, as I said, most of the studies that, um, that I've been a part of, or I'm even reading, are all coming from um, the different genetic sources where we're looking at what these things are actually doing to the actual genome and how long-term effects on the genome is really being affected. So it's not just, oh, you know, I'm, I'm losing weight or, you know, I can run faster. It's like, how are you going to be able to pass these genes on to your kids and to your, uh, to your grandkids and things of that sort? Because that's what you don't realize is that once we start to actually you know, eat this food and have this unhealthy lifestyle and have this stressed out mentality, those genes are being turned and actually you can pass those um, genes on um, to, to, to your uh, future generations as well. You know, so I do so a lot of preconception with patients as well that we get the body to really calm itself down just so you can actually be able to, you know, have the proper amount of, of gene expression. Um, so you can actually make sure that you're passed on the good genes to your offspring versus the ones that you currently have that's, you know, you're all stressed out and things of that sort. Um, but again, back to the whole diet. Diet is sort of, is sort of important because of the fact that we found that, you know, when we use herbs, herbs from a genetic standpoint, herbs have a, what we call a genetic dominance. What does that really mean? Genetic dominance basically means that our body recognizes herbs first and foremost as being its first line of medicine. How did that happen? We've been using herbs for how many thousands of years? So our body recognizes these, these herbs because of the fact that we've been using for so long. You know, um, I, I just wrote a book, not just um, last year, I was part of a team that we wrote a book um, called The Code of Longevity. And my portion of the actual book was about bioactive nutrients. And largely what we've been able to find that even our brain size um, changed over a period of time because of the fact that we start having more of a plant-based diet, more of a seafood type diet versus the individuals that are on the plains and, and, and had more of a, a, a meat diet. And the reason why these bioactive nutrients were largely influencing our genes to actually grow more fast, grow more readily, and actually make us more intelligent as well. So these bioactive nutrients are so important for us. So yes, eating plants and eating vegetables and all these things are so important to show over a long period of time how it's been able to help our health, help our brain, also help us just as an entire society to be more, more apt to do the best things for ourselves through an intelligent standpoint. That's one reason why even as a vegan, I'm, I'm not a proponent of these fake meats. I'm like, these fake meats is fake. There's nothing uh, from a nutritional standpoint that you want to have. I'm like, if you want to eat the fake meat, go ahead and eat the bacon or eat the burger. Does it give you more of a nutrient-dense uh, uh, society anyway, uh, more nutrient-dense uh, um, uh, caloric intake anyway? So if you're doing it because it's the fat, don't be vegan because it's fat, or don't eat the fake meat because of the fat. Don't do that. It's not good for you at all. One, they use canola oil. Canola oil is one of the worst oils you can ever use. And the reason why we've we seen that canola oil is only named canola oil in this country. In other countries, it's called rapeseed oil. And it's, it's called rapeseed oil because it's one of the harshest oils. Most other countries, they use rapeseed oil to actually like oil their machinery. They don't use it to cook with. So do not use canola oil. It's, it's just something that's not good for you to, to actually ingest. 
seed oils are some of the ones that you know you just should, should just stay away from. That's why I said the only oils that I let my my patients um, really use to cook is olive oil, coconut oil, and also palm oil. Palm oil has been, been used for I mean, since the time, I mean, palm oil, coconut oil, and olive oil, those are three oils that you can read in the Bible, and they still, they were using those three oils in largely olive oil. So I'm, I'm like, if it's good in the Bible, I'll still use it. I'm not going to use anything else that was, you know, man-made. So palm, coconut, and also olive oil. Um, and just using the herbs is something that, you know, even our bodies are just so used to for fighting inflammation, for, you know, creating, creating blood circulation, for actually, you know, helping with pain, for helping with diabetes or any sort of metabolic disease as well is so much research out there that shows just by using you know herbs can really help you out the study that was actually done in 2014 where i don't know if you guys know what SIBO is a lot of individuals who who've been on a lot of antibiotics tend to get SIBO SIBO is this overgrown bacteria that's really deadly inside of the actual gut itself and there's some really really harsh um, antibiotics that they have to use to get rid of it but the and actually really truly help the body out if you the chance to actually give it a good try as well. So um, uh, I'll stop there. I don't know if I'm, I'm over my time. I don't have my, my, my watch on me. So are there any questions so far? Are like, you guys enjoying the information? Am I talking too fast? There's so much information that, you know, I just want to make sure that I'm helping you guys out any way I can. Any questions? Thank, thank you, Dr. Weir. Um, I, I do have a question. You was talking about the Seaboat study um, and you were lagging a little bit. Can you just um, tell us a little bit um, about that study? What what was the Seaboat? Can you describe that again? Uh, SIBO is um, an actual overgrown like bacteria in the side of the gut. It's usually because of, of the overuse of antibiotics and, and other, you can have parasites, but it is a, it's a syndrome that we call SIBO. SIBO. Essentially, when you have SIBO, is it becomes more systemic. It can be deadly as well. Um, and individuals have gastrointestinal issues, yada yada yada. But it, you use it on a course of different antibiotics for for months. So essentially, what the study was in 2014 that came out it is it basically it was a, a, a group of um, herbs that they used to actually help com combat SIBO, and then also use it antibiotics and to see which one was, you know, it, was the herbs even possible to even treat SIBO? And they had the same result, meaning, uh, and, and within like the three to five year follow-ups, individuals that were in the herb uh, 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 treatment didn't have any traces of SIBO, you know, sort of come back as well, which is huge. So it showed they was able, able to not just get rid of it, but also keep it away once you were on the, on the herbal uh, uh, therapy for a while too. It was very important, so. Thank you. You're very, very Any, welcome. Anybody yeah. else have any questions? Yes, I have a question, Dr. Ware. Thank you so much that there, that was a power packed in, information that you gave. Like my brain is like excited <laughs> about so many of the things that you said. You talked about herbs um, having a genetic dominance in the body. Um, and, and frankly, that's one of the easiest things that we can, you know, grow in, in our home year round, me yes. being in Minnesota, we only have about three good months, but <laughs> <laughs> um, are, are there, <laughs> it's true. Are there certain herbs um, that are, are, you know, if you only had to choose three or four, right? What are, are there certain ones that we should probably try to include the most of? Yes, you know, and the great thing is this right here: the the herbs doesn't they don't have to be fresh. You can actually use the dry herbs too. Um, Mex Mexican oregano, oh my gosh, it, you know, uh, seeing the difference between you know Italian oregano, Mexican oregano, uh, North American oregano was just phenomenal. But the Mexican oregano was able to actually do several things with inflammatory responses inside of the gut, but also the brain as well was also to help reduce that. Uh, but also it helped with blood circulation. I was like, this is crazy. Mexican oregano, but then, you know, I actually, you know, if you ever taste oregano, you'll see how pungent it really is. So it does a whole lot for, for inflammation as well. So uh, Mexican oregano, 
time. Rosemary is phenomenal for brain response, guys. You got to understand that there's so many, so much studies done on just rosemary and how individuals who even smelling rosemary, um, the oxygen level in the brain has actually increased as well. So I always, I'm telling individuals, have rosemary, have thyme, have the Mexican oregano, have sage. Sage is actually one of the oldest herbs uh, um, that was actually um, been used for medicine. medicine. <laughs> You know, and, and why is that? Because it's been shown to actually really help out uh, urinary tract infection. And it show out, help out with cramps and all these other things. Um, what else? That was Mexican oregano, sage. Uh, that was thyme, uh, rosemary. Um, so I would say stay with those four, but honestly, just, just play with herbs. Just eat and make sure the herbs that, um, that you're having are just the plain herb, just the plain dry herb, of course, the organic phenomenal, but just put herbs on your food. Like just sprinkle more herbs on your food. Um, I actually had a patient um, that I did a consult with a few months ago, and she was she used to laugh at her grandmother because every time her grandmother would come, she would get like these huge bags of fresh herbs and use a mortar and pestle and grind them up, and put olive oil inside of it. And, but every night her mom would put a dollop of that on there. And she did this lady's, she um, has sickle cell SS. Her hemoglobin level had never been under a 10.5. She had ne she'd been in the hospital I think once or twice, but she was actually, it was funny. She was actually like consulting me. She was like, but you know, I thought my grandmother was crazy. You know, this old, I'm like, I'm like, no, keep doing that. Keep doing that. You know, the, the only thing thing for me, just keep doing it, eat a proper diet, learn how to, you know, manage stress and things of that sort. So guys, there are minor things that we can do. And, and you know, I, I can get even to, in, even to the research um, with my, my supplements uh, that we have had double bond studies on. It's been in germs, whatever. But as you see, I, I choose not to even jump in there because I want to give you guys practical things you can do on a daily basis that's going to also help your body out. So just by using herbs, you know, is, is, is phenomenal. Wow, thank you so much. Very welcome. And yes, Minnesota, I, I'll say two months. I, I'll say, me personally, I'm, I'm in South Florida, so it's, it's about two months that you guys have. <laughs> we acclimate to it, we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful state, though. It's beautiful state. I, I, I have to visit up there again. Yeah, in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions, any other comments? I do. Um, I wanted to know, since you spoke about herbs and I, I rely heavily on herbs, um, which you said oregano, um, rosemary, I keep a rosemary plant, aloe um, yeah. is another natural. Um, have you tried moringa? Um, I've tried moringa. I mean, I, I love moringa because I say it's like, the all natural multivitamin it essentially has almost all of um, the vitamins inside of it. Um, Moringa grows wild down here in South Florida. I mean, it's like you would cut the trees down because there's so many of them down here. So um, I personally don't use Moringa, uh, but I tell a lot of patients, hey, look, just, just take the tea, just drink the tea. I, I prefer that I'm drinking the tea over like, you know, powder and things of that sort. Uh, but occasionally you'll see me put it inside of, of my drink. Oh, by the way, guys, um, I, I'll tell you my drink as well. This is turmeric, ginger, lemon, and a little bit of olive oil. I drink this every day. I grate down my, my ginger. I grate down my turmeric. I squeeze my lemon, like a little quarter piece of lemon, um, put a little bit of olive oil inside of it, um, and I let it um, steep in some warm water for about five minutes. Anti-inflammatory, you know, reduces the amount of mucus you're, you're putting inside um, your body, and it actually helps flush the body. Uh, the phytonutrients in here just help the brain wake itself up, also help the gut wake itself up. Um, and the reason why I put a little bit of, of um, olive oil inside here is because, again, you know, your body needs the oils anyway. So why not just put a little dollop in there and have your body just get what it needs? But I drink about, about 24 ounces of this every morning before I even go to work. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's something that I've been doing for years now, and I love it. So, um, yeah, I'll always say everyone about, about this, um, this recipe. Mm -hmm. Anything else, guys? Thank you. You remember one thing that you had mentioned, which kind of stuck with me, was um, rest. How important um, making sure that we rest and repair our bodies. And a lot of times, um, you know, when um, management managing sickle cell disease or whether ma managing anemia. Um, 
we kind of have challenges with rest. And um, so I wanted to, to know what is the, the best way to, to start basically a healthy mindset to um, make sure we get that rest. Um, do you um, recommend a particular time of, of starting that meditation and stretch and then wind down um, in order to get into a routine? Um, so so what, what would be the best way to start on this journey if we haven't been on this journey of making sure we you know, dedicate that time to rest. Cause I know even as a entrepreneur, you know, it's always this busy time. I could be up, I will have my computer next to me in bed, which is a bad thing. <laughs> um, and I'm realizing um, just having that time and, and what you said was so important to me, um, put the devices away, put them far away so you can get that rest. So, so would you say, um, how could you start this routine um, in order to make sure you get that rest. Yeah. What's the best I mean, way? So, I mean, the, the best way to start is start now, essentially, and just start start to really flip your mind, your mind towards um, what's best for you. And trust me, I'm an entrepreneur myself, and I used to be that guy that had two phones walking around into my, my patient, you know, room and trying to put them away, and then I'll, I'll get a dean. So I, I was that guy for, 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 for like, like years ago. And so I realized that I wasn't Superman and I actually had a really bad um, crisis that was actually in, in this arm right here and it actually went up to, to my head and I, I just couldn't function. I said, like, wait a minute, hold up. I, I'm preaching this natural uh, mindset. Um, it happened about maybe eight years ago. I'm preaching this natural mindset, but I'm still doing a lot of things that I'm not, you know, learning myself. So um, with that, I went down to one phone and sometimes actually I lose my phone. I'm like, I think I left it at the office or whatever. So I had to sort of like calm myself down. But how do you start the journey right here and right now? First things first is it's the call sleep hygiene. It's like how are you going to sort of clean your your mind, your body, and everything else to get prepared for? I'll say that you know first thing is prioritize what's important to you. The sleep should be important and not catching up on Netflix, you know, that, oh, oh, that show and things of that sort, or not you know being on Facebook and things of that sort. So I say maybe an hour before of your bedtime, and you everyone should be in bed before 11 o'clock, before 11 o'clock, trust me. Um, and, and the reason why, because you want to make sure that you're asleep during those those, those those hours because that's when your body is going to heal mostly. So I always tell people, if you shower at night, you know, shower early, you know, make sure the last time you drink anything is going to be an hour and a half before you actually go to bed as well. So drink your, your tea or whatever so you can calm down, relax, and then go shower. And then start to gently stretch from there. Start to gently, you can pray and meditate while you're in the shower and things of that sort. Get your mind, you know, set up for the next day. Something that I learned from um, Warren Buffett, I was actually at a conference with him years ago. And someone asked him, how do you get all your stuff done in a day? You, you control all these things. How, how do you get everything done? He said, I do 10 things a day. I write them down the night before. And that's all I do. I don't care if I get, you know, you know, whatever's on my plate, I get only those 10 things done and everything else I worry about the next day. So I started doing that years ago. I have a notepad out by my phone that, you know, I'll write all my things down and I just, I just leave it to 10 and that's it. And even sometimes I'll be meditating. So, oh, I forgot to do that. And I'll go and I'll write that last thing down, come back and reset myself and meditate, stretch a little bit more. And I get in bed. And I'm, when I get in bed, I get in bed and say, wow, this is the place that now it's time for me to reset and rest. So I, I'm mindful about how, how I look at my bed. I'm mindful how I look at my bedroom versus just, again, is for me to, okay, well, I'm getting away from my kids. So I'm, I'll come in here because I do have a desk in my, in my bedroom that it's only for me to just to read at, you know, I don't even sit on my, my bed and read. I sit at my desk and read. So it's, it's different things like that, just to just reset your own space to make sure that your space is for rest and relaxation. It's not for, okay, just another, another task just to do. But you got to start somewhere. Can you, Dr. Ware, can you clarify the difference between um, prebiotics and probiotics? It just throws me every time. And, and you know, obviously there's, there's a lot of products that are being sold out there on, on both sides, but it, it has everything to do with gut health, I understand, but I just get confused between those two terms. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, a prebiotic is something that your body needs in order for a probiotic to actually happen. Okay, so a prebiotic really is if you eat, you know, uh, like leafy greens, or whatever, that's really a prebiotic because you're so the probiotics need something to eat to, to munch off of, right? So the carbohydrates inside of that, yeah, the, those leafy greens are going to be what the probiotics actually eat. So a prebiotic is only something that sets up probiotics, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, a fuel source for them. That's all it is. So like me personally, um, when, again, if you ask me about prebiotics or even probiotics, I say, honestly, eat a ton of leafy greens. Um, and then as far as probiotics, I say, eat fermented foods like sauerkraut. Um, you can eat kefir. Uh, again, stay away from dairy. If any, anyone's eating dairy still, please get off dairy. Most individuals with, with African descent, what we've seen from a genetic standpoint, has an inflammatory response to dairy. So please do not have any sort of dairy at all, right? So um, let's say, oh yeah, so, so, so essentially, you know, the, the, the probiotics is gonna be you know, the, the fermented food, the kimchi, the, the kefir, the goat kefir or water kefir, the alternative yogurts, um, uh, the goat yogurt, sheep yogurt, things of that sort. That's, they are great prebiotic, probiotics for your body to sort of rebuild itself. Um, if you're going to have to do a pure probiotic, make sure that it's, it's in the refrigerated section. It, it cannot be on the shelf because, again, you know, those enzymes they use to, to keep it, you know, uh, on the shelf are actually taken away from the digestive uh, process of the body. In fact, the only company I use for, for probiotics is a company called Natrins, N-A-T-R-E-N-S.com, N-A-T-R-E-N-S.com. Um, because they, they were the, the first ones to actually put up the whole concept of probiotics. For the last 50 years, they've been doing probiotics, and they only ship their products to you um, with, with ice bags. You know, they, they say you keep everything frozen the, the, the entire way. So when you get it, they say put it in your refrigerator immediately, you know, as well. So you keep all your stuff refrigerated, but they have a great, some great strands um, there because most of the commercial strands are, are so stepped on, it's not the original strain, and it's something that um, can actually cause the overgrowth of, of the bad bacteria. So activity and stuff like that, is, is too much sugar in that stuff. It's, 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 it shouldn't be um, as sweet as, as it is as well. Anything else, guys? This is great. Thank you guys. These are some great questions. These are some, some, some great questions. Um, I, I think in the, you know, typically because I, I didn't want to eat last week as well. Um, and, and essentially the questions are usually just, you know, okay, what, what should I take right now? Things of that sort. The questions coming out of here are just more foundational stuff, you know, and, and I love helping individuals build a foundation so they, they can actually build off of, so they can actually understand how their body is going to function. So it's a beautiful thing. Thank you guys so much, so much for the questions. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Dr. Ware. It's been a while. It's been a while. How you doing? I'm doing great. Um, my question is, what do you think about stevia as a sugar substitute? Um, okay, so I'm going to stay right in the middle with stevia. Stevia is more so of an alcohol, right? And, and it's not per se, it's not a sweetener that you taste. Because if you taste um, stevia, it doesn't taste sweet. It has this bitter quality to it, right? So essentially, it's not a sweetener to, to, your, to your tongue. It's more a sweetener inside of your body. So it's not per se a bad thing. The good thing with stevia, it actually burns up pretty fast. There's not too much um, um, byproducts with it. And it actually has a little bit of inulin inside of it. Inulin is actually another prebiotic that the body actually needs uh, to, to break certain things down. It's not a bad thing. I'll just say if you can do it, maybe do it in the, in the liquid form. And the reason why I like the liquid form um, is because of the fact that your body's going to absorb that a lot faster than anything else. Um, but I personally like date sugar. Uh, the reason why I like date sugar is a natural sugar. I mean, it's just the date itself that's been dehydrated and just ground up. Um, so it's really, really sweet, but it also has a ton of uh, uh, trace minerals inside of it, magnesium, selenium, uh, zinc, vitamin C. I mean, it has a lot of things inside there and it's inside the sugar. So I prefer date sugar, um, even over monk sugar. I, I, I'm just a huge fan of date sugar. And they actually have date syrup um, as well. You can find that um, in some Publix and also some Whole Foods um, that, again, it has all of the nutrients inside there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're very welcome. 
Thank you so problem. much. This is great information. This is a wealth of information to um, us. Um, definitely, I'm, I'm, I've learned so much. Um, and thank you for your dedication to the community that, that battles chronic illnesses, because you've been so dedicated to the rare disease community, as well as um, the sickle cell community, those that are fi fighting chronic illness and pain. So I really just thank you. Um, in the um, chat, I've also put in, um, um, Healing Blends Global website. So um, those that are interested in checking out the website and learning even more, it's a wealth of, of information on that website. Um, and there is a contact page on the website where you can also contact um, Dr. Weir. Um, we have we we have gained so much information about our health and wellness and and how important it is for us to um, be conscious of our intake and rest. Um, I thank you so much, Dr. Weir. And um, any more questions? We'll take one last question if there's any. Okay. Well, thank awesome. you, Dr. Weir. Um, we are happy to have you and um, we'll continue discussions as we continue to have questions. We'll definitely be inviting you to our future forums. And um, we have we are gravitated to learn so much in order to live a, a healthier lifestyle. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And again, uh, I'm here at your, at your disposal. Just let's reach out and I'll be more than happy. Thank you. I say bless. Take care. Okay. So um, right now we're just going to um, get ready to transition um, into our next just greetings from a, a speaker. Right now I'm going to just be ready to share my screen. So one second. Just wanted to take the time to thank all our partners um, and sponsors. Um, our goal sponsor, um, Medwick USA and Bluebird Buyer. Um, also our silver sponsor, GBT and Pharma Therapeutics and bronze sponsor, Trumo Blue, Blood and Blood, sorry, Blood and Cell Technologies and also one of our supporters, which is Novartis. So I just wanted to take the time to acknowledge the support and we thank you because without you, um, this, this form is, wouldn't be possible to have the necessary resources we need in order to um, provide the education and advocacy that we need for, it, for our community. Just wanna take time to thank again, Dr. Weir for joining us um, and providing that um, information on nutrition and alternative, med medicine, alternative methods to pain management. And now we will have greetings from Pharma Therapeutics. And I welcome Shirley Miller, which is on to join us. Thank you, Carla. And good morning to all of today's participants. I bring you a warm hello and greetings from Pharma Therapeutics, a small biotech company based in Boston, Massachusetts, doing research in sickle cell and other hematological disorders. But I also bring you hope as a 65 year old living well with sickle cell SS. I haven't been hospitalized in over 15 years because of my regimen with sickle cell. And one of the reasons I joined Pharma was that I saw that they had a special interest in those that live with sickle cell, people just like me. They would ask me what it means to live with sickle cell. What does a person go through? And what can they do to help spread awareness, support the education, as well as supporting the advocacy and research? Forma is deeply committed to transforming the lives of people living with sickle cell disease. Our team is on a mission to build a much needed bridge of trust between the biotech industry 
and the sickle cell community through opportunities to work on projects like the Empowered Caregivers Forum. I could have retired like my other friends who turned 65 this year, but I wasn't ready to end my 20 plus years of advocating for sickle cell disease. I decided there was much more to do and I needed to continue to contribute. I found a way in joining Pharma Therapeutics. At Pharma, we look for opportunities to educate all of our staff, whether they're IT or accounting, it doesn't matter where you work in the uh, organization, you get an education on sickle cell disease. Everyone gets an education on sickle cell. It is important that everyone who works at Pharma understands what it means to have sickle cell and how that impacts a person's life. Our approach is similar to the work that Carla and Ray are doing in that we want to provide much needed support to the sickle cell community. We all collectively continue to learn and grow in our understanding of the journey because I tell them they can't go by my journey. They have to understand the journeys of many because we, are very, we have various degrees of pain and experiences and other things that social determinants of health, you know, that impact our ability to live a better life. This knowledge continues to fuel our passion of commitment to deliver transformative medicines that will improve the lives of those living with sickle cell disease. Carla and Ray, congratulations on what I believe will be another successful Empowered Caregivers Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shirley. Um, thank you. We, uh, we, we really have the pleasure of having you here and actually having you as an advocate in the community. Congratulations on your new journey of joining Pharma Therapeutics. Thank and um, it's, it's nice to know that um, someone from the community that understands the community is actually um, working with a pharmaceutical company that can give the perspective from a patient perspective and right. also advocate perspective. So thank you so much for joining us and we welcome you. Thank you so much. Okay, so currently we are moving on to breaking the silence, living with sickle cell. So I a welcome Mr. James Griffin, author. I will read a little bit about his bio and we will allow him to tell us a little bit about his journey. James Griffin is a writer, speaker, and sickle cell advocate and, published, and a published author. He is the best known for his book, Breaking the Silence, Living with Sickle Cell Anemia. In 2013, he began advocating for sickle cell. And since then, he has been using his voice to make an impact to change the lives of others and raise awareness for sickle cell. James has spoken in rooms full of healthcare professionals, students, researchers, patients, and caregivers. He has spoken at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, been featured on public access TV, in magazines, online, news articles, and other media outlets. He was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and continues to pursue his goals not to let his health stop or define him. Currently, James works in the medical field as a medical professional taking care of others. So James, we welcome you to the Empowered Caregivers Forum, and we look forward to this discussion. And um, here, I thank you for just sharing your voice of breaking the silence of sickle cell disease. And um, you pretty much, um, um, as a male um, entering the community space of talking about sickle cell, I just want to know why is was it important to you to just talk about sickle cell? First of all, I want to say thank you for having me on the show. Um, I appreciate the offer. Let me speak today and share my experiences. Um, as a male, it was important for me to speak out about sickle cell because so often uh, we get the most stereotype and negative attention as, as males in a in this country. So not only with sickle cell, but it comes with 
um, just just living. So we get so much stereotype and we, we don't speak out and we go through mental health issues that are unspoken because no one thinks we go through these things because we as males, we're supposed to be strong. Um, we never show that vulnerability side of us. So I wanted to speak out and, you know, encourage others to speak out and let them know that it's okay to speak out. Um, so many times too, we get forgotten and we don't, they don't think our pain is serious and we're able to have pain because we're male. So we're able to um, take that pain, um, you know. So I wanted to speak out about that and just share my thoughts, share my feelings about sickle cell and just really encourage others to speak out because it's important that we talk about these things. It's important that we address uh, the mental health aspect of it. And it's important that we be voices for the younger generations that's coming up so they, don't have it as hard as us when it comes to speaking out, um, expressing their pain. And that, that was my reason for speaking out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to also know you had um, basically your journey with sickle cell. Can you share what type of sickle cell um, you you have and 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 growing up, what was your what was the what did your support circle look like? So I have sickle cell SS. Um, you know, my support circle was very my family. It was my family, so they were very supportive of me. Um, when I would go to the hospital or get sick at home, they would go get me things like um, water or sodas from the store or just the, my prescriptions because, um, you know, I needed that to help help take care of myself. And so they was a very important. They've always been supportive. We all went to the same school because my sisters and me and uh, brother, we're like four years apart each way. So um, we were in school together. So when I missed school, they would go get my homework for me so I could keep up, um, you know, and they were just very, they understood what I was going through, even though they didn't know the effects or how bad it affected me. And when I wrote the book, they said, wow, I didn't know, like, you know, you went through that. And I get to see another side because I was there with you, but I didn't know, like, how bad it affected you. Um, so, but the support system was very good for me. Um, my mother always told them, you know, preach family. So we were very close. We were all we had really. So um, they stayed, they stayed close and they, they watched over me and helped me out with things and they still support it to this day. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Ray, you want to jump in with any questions before I go yeah. on? <laughs> sure do. I have a question. So yes. um, I am the mother of a 25 year old um, male living with sickle cell disease. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is um, friendships and dating as a man with sickle cell disease. Can you speak a little bit to how um, being a male with sickle cell disease has, has how you've navigated um, uh, uh, your dating life or, or um, friend life and social life uh, and how, how that has um, impacted some of the ways that you not just feel about yourself, but you perceive others feel about you? Okay. So, um... Well, I wasn't always open. That's the one thing about me. I wasn't always open about my sickle cell. It didn't, I didn't begin being open until I got older as an adult, like in my 20, 26, uh, around the age 26. And then um, I got on hydroxyurea. So once I got on that, it was easier for me to be, stay out of the hospital and be like normal. So I felt comfortable sharing my experiences and telling, telling my friends that I had sickle cell. And I knew I had, it was a time that I had to tell them because just in case we were out somewhere and I went into a crisis. And if they didn't know what was going on, then how could I help myself? So I had to be open and share that. And the same thing that came with dating, it, it was important for me to let uh, the girls know that I dated, that I had sickle cell. So just so that they was aware of what I was going through, it was something that it's always on my mind, like when is the right time to tell them? But I felt like if I was close enough and I felt like like that this relationship might work I felt open enough to tell them and I had to be honest with them up front and tell them because like I said there were times when I didn't tell them and you know relationships were it put a strain on relationships because I was always withdrawn whenever I would go through a crisis so by me not opening up and sharing I feel like I missed out on like a lot of things and a lot of 
uh, things could have been said and done. And I could have had that support in relationships. And now I look at it like if I tell somebody and they have a negative attitude towards it or they don't understand me or they don't want to be there because of it, then they're not meant for me, meant to be in my life. So I just continue to share that information and let others know just so they are aware of what I go through. It's nothing to be ashamed about anymore. Um, and that was always a big, big thing to me. I was ashamed of it more so than anything. And that's why I kept it hidden. Wow, thank you so much for, for being so transparent in that, in that response. How do you think that um, as you've gotten older and you know, you're on a, a career path and you work and you, know, you're, you, you, have, you manage your sickle cell obviously much different when, as you get older than you did when you were younger, but <clears throat> how do you manage um, you know, working with, with supervisors and, and HR departments? How do you share your, your, your diagnoses with, with work? Um, how has that um, been something that's worked favorably for you? And then can you talk about a time maybe that it didn't feel like it worked as favorable, like they, they, they knew too much about you or they, they weren't sensitive to you or to, can you just talk a little bit more about that? I find that there's a lot of, of young adults um, who, who are concerned about what they're going to do for a living and, and um, not losing another job. And how have you navigated that to find a career path? Well, um, first of all, it's, it took my health into anything I do. So, and this comes from my mother telling me, you know, try to find something that you can do either with your hands or just like a job that fits you. Because at sickle cell, people with sickle cell, it's harder for us to do certain jobs. Like I had jobs stocking and working at FedEx that I had to let go because of the heavy lifting and bending. It takes a toll on your body and you go through crisis. And then you have to deal with telling the supervisors you can't come in and work or, you know, you're out sick and you miss a couple of days. So for me, it was just picking the right career path. And finally, I found a career path through the last 10 years where I choose my own schedule. So I'm able to have those breaks in between when I need to. I'm able to work when I want to. Um, so I can get that rest in between the days of uh, work for me. Um, one of the things I do every time I, no matter what, every time I got hired, I always let the HR know and my immediate supervisor know. And since I work in a hospital now, I feel like they're more understanding because they should know what sickle cell is. Most jobs don't know what it is. You, you tell them up front that you, you have sickle cell and you may miss days, then they think you want to take off already and they think you're looking for a vacation. So I try not to tell them like um, too much information too soon. When I got hired, I'll just let them know I have sickle cell and you know it, it is a disability and sometimes I may miss work, but that's about all I give them until I'm in that situation and then I can have my doctor's excuses. And so it's just being open with them upfront and honest and just letting the immediate supervisors know, the HR know so that they don't hold it against me when the time comes. Now I've had times when I've told supervisors and or went into job interviews and I feel like that was held against me because they was thinking that he can't be here. He's gonna miss work. It's gonna uh, take away from our production. So, um, you know, those were times where that you know, you know, made me get down because I didn't get the job and I felt and I knew it was because of that. So it's just finding things that work for me. Um, I wrote the book just because I was a gifted writer. So I decided to write and try to find things that I could do. I enjoy um, basketball. So I worked in stadiums. I did customer service. So it's just finding things that I could do. And that was uh, some of the things I've done. And, you know, like, when it comes to being sick, or sorry about that. When it comes to being sick too, you know, we get sick and we may have to call off. I learned to not go in when I was sick because I always wear a smile and I know how to mask my pain. So when they see me, they don't know that I'm sick. We look healthy. And so like when I get to work, it's harder for me to get off because they like, you, you came here now, you don't want to work. So I learned to just, if I feel a crisis, I'm having a crisis, just don't go in. Wow, that, that's really good advice. I like that. 
And then last but not least, because this is um, caregiver empowerment, yes. you know, as, as a man now living with sickle cell disease, how best do the caregivers um, in your life participate in your care? Um, you know, you, you are independent, you've learned more about your disease, you manage it well, but you know, none of us are islands unto ourselves. And so we have our support system. How best do your support systems at the age that you are now support you in an empowered way? Well, they support me by just being there. If I go to the hospital um, and and have to stay overnight, they come they come there. They sit with me. They um, bring things to make me comfortable. The things I like from home, uh, books to read. Um, they take me to pick up my prescriptions. They're just always there. I can talk to them and tell them how I'm feeling, and they understand me, and they don't um, have any negative things to say about me being sick. So it's just, um, I'm always talking about my health and I'm always letting them know. And they help me learn, learn and understand how, how they feel too. Because I had a girl tell me uh, one time, like while I was in the hospital, you don't know how I feel like watching you because I'm always, because I, I get so used to just going in and know how I feel that, you know, it's like, it's just another crisis, but it's times where I need to relay more information to them. And so they let me know that you know, I have to be telling them everything that's going on and just um, they can deal with it themselves, but just be more open to telling them just because I don't know how they're feeling. They go through the same thing, not physically, but they go through emotional pain and, um, you know, like stress too by us being in the hospital. And we just get so used to, you know, being seeing it from our side and being there and dealing with the pain on our own. It's just normal for us to go, go to the hospital and be fine and just be like, it's another crisis when indeed we should just be more, um, tell more information and tell more about it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, James, you know me, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna come out and ask this question, right? Because this yes. is a follow-up. Um, because those are all beautiful and when the people are there for you and they're helping you, but when do caregivers and your support system get on your nerves? When are you like, I don't want to hear no more advice. I don't want, I don't need help with that. <laughs> tell, like, let's talk about those things. Cause those are real. Cause my son yeah. would tell me, he's like, mom, I already hear your voice in my head. You don't need to say it. Like we, we, those are very real for caregivers who like over love. Like we just yeah. want, to be involved in and help in whatever ways we can, but sometimes we getting on y'all's nerves. Yeah, yeah, it could be um overprotection and, and the worry. And so it's like um when you get ready to take a trip, you know, make sure you drink or continue to drink or how you doing. It's the it's the every five minutes we feel like we don't need to know that because we do know how to take care of ourselves and we just want you there when we need your help. But um it's just the the constantly worrying about it because sometimes we don't want to worry about our health and we and we know and understand that we have this. I once told my mother, you worry too much. And then she got real upset and then started crying. And, and you know, but it's just one of those things where we got this. We're at the age now, we've been dealing with it. Like if it's something bad, then we will let you know. But for the most part, we don't need the constant every five minutes or you know, or make sure you do this, make sure you do that, because it, it feels like um, we want that responsibility. It feels like you're trying to take that from us sometimes. So thank you. Thank you for keeping you're it welcome. real. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you, Carla. Thank you so much, um, Ray and James, for just um just just emphasizing on that. One of the things that you had you had mentioned was um when the time is right or important to share the information that um, about sickle cell and talk about it more. And um, as, as a mom actually having a, a teenage male that um, from the stages of understanding that, okay, his mom's an advocate, she talks and him having to actually um, speak in engagements because he was traveling with me, right? So it kind of fell yeah. into what, what he started to do and like, hey, you you want to go ahead and just, you know, tell, <laughs> tell your story while well, why are you speaking to these legislators? So um, he was just kind of roped in, but as, as, as a stage of um, being a te teenager and um, being conscious of maybe not wanting to share your story with those friends and those, you know, your family members know, but not wanting to share it um, with um, the friends that you may have because of that stage um, of where you are in your life. Um, can you talk about um, that? 
when when was that time that you felt okay now i feel that it's important to talk because we still do have a lot of um young youths and teenagers that you talk about it with your circle your family that you're that no but you won't this is not something you would kind of mention to um an outside person because the maybe the stigma that may be related or this the normalcy of your other friends don't talk. We're not, that's not what you talk about when you um with together. So yeah. when did you feel was the breaking point form for you that you felt that, okay, I'm going to talk about it with my friends and, and even decide to let, you know, others know that you might be dating with where, whereas that was something you would never mention before. It was when I got older, I decided I had to talk. I, I didn't, I've been silent for too long. I had to talk. I had to share this information. I was getting older and I looked at my illness differently I looked at it like it's a part of me and this is who I am so I have to share this to let others know that this is me and like I said if, if they judge me on it then that's fine then that they're not meant to be there but I think if I could go back and share it earlier I would have because the sooner you share it the better you 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 feel um it's a heavy burden lift off for you and I know sometimes we don't want to share it in our teen years be just because we want to feel like we, we can keep up with the rest we want to feel normal um, no one understands. That's another part reason why we don't share. No one understands. And it's a lot of trauma and like mental stress we go through because of going through what we go through. Like I always wanted to play sports, but I wasn't able to play competitively because, you know, a sport playing sports up and down, running up and down the field could land me in a hospital in a crisis. So I couldn't play it. So it's, it's, it's that that we think about. And so we don't want to be judged, but I think it's easier it's better for you to share earlier and just to be open about it and share share with others just so you can enjoy your life and just you know live life without having to worry about you know is this person going to worry i have sickle cell or what and i used to have jaundice eyes and i still never shared it so that was a, always a thing that bothered me and and two another thing like maybe sometimes we go through things where we share information when we're younger and we get teased for it. that happened to me when I was open I was open about it and it was just like oh you got a disease and everybody start running away so um this is when I was playing at a park so it's just like I don't have you know it's not contagious people don't understand it I feel like if it was more on tv if it was more talked about if it was more normalized then we would be okay because when we hear things like cancer nobody says oh cancer we feel like more sympathetic and we can empathize with that person so if, i feel like if sickle cell had that awareness then we wouldn't have these negative stereotypes about sickle cell i, I can't hear you i have one question um, for college, let me see, because I know we all went to college and everything. Was it difficult for you to go to college with sickle cell? Because I know it was difficult for me when I went to college when I have sickle cell. That was many moons on like 2009 to 2012. Was it difficult for you? It was difficult for me. And I, luckily, I spoke to my um, advisors. I, I let them know what I had in, in my professors because they were the ones that needed to know so i had a, one professor and he was african-american and he he knew about it so he related to me so when i missed class he would allow me to come in like when i felt better and, and catch up and he would have me come to his office and tell me what i missed so just just by being open it helped me and it helped me get through college and it's time going to medical school um uh, for my medical assistant uh i missed the week and when you miss school like it's, it's certain things that you can't miss in these programs regardless of your condition. So I missed the week and I decided to, you know, not go the rest of the semester because I didn't want to just go into a test and, and fail. So I decided to not go into a semester. Um, but, and that, you know, that kind of weighed on me because I was just like, man, I wanted to finish with my class. I did finish right on time though, but it was just like, um, I, while I was in the hospital, I was down about it like, man, but I had to realize that I have to do things on my time. My time may not be everybody else's. I may be a little bit behind just because of my help, but guess what? I'm going to finish it. But I would just say, um, you know, just keeping up and just being, letting your professors know because it does get difficult with all the work and the stress. And stress is a big thing that causes a crisis. So you have to try to eliminate those stresses as much as possible.
Okay, that's good because um, since I'm with the um, the education, I don't want the same thing what the kids are transitioning and doing. Hold on, let me close my door. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so I don't want, because back when I was in Monroe College, I studied, I studied IT, but I finished all my three and a half years of college and I got my degree in IT. So uh -huh. it was a it was a difficult thing because I'm glad you're speaking point of view of the colleges and we don't want like the students here in who have sickle cell go through the same thing I go through that we didn't have an office of disability we didn't have um, mostly we didn't know about it and then they because they be like oh since so she's smart me because my uh -huh. you know because I graduated with a regular high school diploma not a IEP and none of that so they be like oh we're gonna take her straight there. But it was very difficult the college years and we don't want the transition students um go through what i went through in college and what we went through as us when we were in our 30s you know the 30 and up crew what we went through and you know we just want to educate them properly that's that's my goal is we want to educate them properly what they need to do when they start college but thank yeah. you thank you for asking yeah. my question and you I made a good point to um Make sure you go to your administrator and let them know about this your disability because they do have programs or they do have things that are in place for you. Like some of those things I didn't know going into college either. So I didn't know, so I just didn't um, follow up with it. But um, if you know about them, then they can help you get your school in and do what you wanna do. Great, thank you so much. One of the other questions that, um, I just thank you for sharing that information, but one of the other questions that I had during your, we, 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 we like to talk about um, the youths and young adults just transitioning. And I yeah. know Sarai had mentioned this and you had mentioned a little bit about going to college, but um, what was the most important for um, you while you was in that stage to transition from pediatric to adulthood um, as far as um, that transition to adult care. What, what was your support like and what did you find most valuable to you during that time? I would say having a trusted doctor. So that because I transitioned out of a, a pediatrics care, they helped me find someone in their network who they thought would be good with my sickle cell as an adult. Now, that doesn't always help when I go to the emergency room, but they put me in the right place to, so that I can have the right care and, and somebody who understands in their network so they could communicate because a lot of times this should be a this should be a team. So, but when you get with certain doctors, they don't always communicate with other doctors. And you're like, well, I have a hematologist and I have a, a regular physician and they're not communicating. So um, just make sure that you have a trusted doctor because they did help me and they did look out for me and allow me to come back into pediatrics to put me on hydroxyurea and to, to fo have follow-up appointments. So that was big for me, just having the right doctor and just, you know, um, staying in contact with that doctor as long as I could until I moved into adult care and pediatric care, I mean, pedi adult care. And it took me a while too to find a doctor that I was comfortable with, because that's another thing. We have to be comfortable with the ones who are taking care of us. And so it took me a while, but I did end up finding someone who was comfortable with me. And then they, they like I said, they listened to the uh, pediatric uh, sickle cell clinic and they were able to take advice for them and help them help care for me. So that's important to have a trusted doctor. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yes, it is very important to have a trusted doctor, especially when you're going through that particular stage of transition. And we, we hear a lot about um, the importance of just needing more adult care doctors that understand, right? Yes. As well, um, that is a challenge just in every state that understands and have the compassion to care for our adults that's in transition and um and they're on so the the other thing that i would wanted to ask is because you you mentioned um starting to take um medication um and i know that as a mom it's, it, it it has been um somewhat of a an experience for me to to help now my son that's in that transition stage to okay we we're, we're, we're remember meds and 
And so what, what system worked best for you? And we hear doctors talk about compliance, compliance of appointments, compliance of taking meds. Um, I wanted to know what helped you in that transition stage in order to um, now take hold on now you're the adult, right? Having yes. to schedule appointments. Now you're the adult um, having to take this medication. So what has what helped you in that that transition stage in order to remember now your meds, right? That you right. have to yeah. take maybe before you had assistance, um, especially as caregivers. You remember that that oversensitive love that we give <laughs> um, that Ray was talking about. Um, so I just wanted to know um, what what helped you to kind of um, come in that come come to that um, where, awareness of compliance of how you need to best handle um, remembering to take your meds and making appointments and rescheduling it rescheduling um, reordering your meds. So how 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 did you um, develop a system for that? Well, when I was younger, my mother stayed on top of me. She always told me, you know, make sure whatever medication it is, make sure you um, understand what they're giving you. Make sure you know the doses and um, always read the labels. So and ask questions about it if you don't know what it is. So that helped me, you know, remember the importance of knowing what, what I'm taking and the, and the importance of continuing to take my medication. And for me, a system was every time I eat breakfast, I had my pills. So I, I had my morning pills. And if it was, I took something twice a day, I would take it at night. So just that little thing, I never set alarm, but I would always breakfast, morning pills. And then at night dinner uh, was the afternoon pills. Of I had to take more than one. So I did have to remember to stay on top of the medication because the medications help. And then also just, um, just knowing that if I don't follow up with the appointments, then they're going to think that I, I am being non-compliant and then they, they're not going to want to help me as much as, as they can because some most doctors want to help you if you act like you want to help yourself. If you, mm -hmm. if you show up late and you don't, don't come to appointments, they're just going to say, you don't care, I don't care. You know, and so like having that relationship is going to help you when you're in a doc hospital and you need their help. Um, when you're going through a crisis and you need them to prescribe medicine, oh, they, they're going to say, oh, James is in here all the time. I know know him. He's on top of his health. So um, that was very important. And that's what I learned is to stay in contact with my doctor, sh show up to all my appointments, even after I got out of the hospital. I don't want to go into the hospital, uh, a doctor's appointment, because I know I'm feeling good, but I do the follow-up appointments just to let them know that, okay, he's going to follow up. He's just not here for the medication. And so I feel like that helps me. And um, going to the same hospital that, you know, I get care with going to their emergency room so that they can call up or, you know, have beds ready for me when I do have that chance to, when I do get sick and have to go into the hospital. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm just going to have one question and I'll open it up to everybody else. Um, you spoke about masking pain yes. and, um, Sometimes that um, you, um, we actually learn um, that sometimes being a warrior, um, they have had to have situations where they have to mask their pain in order to get by, whether work, school, or um, just um, just occasions. So, can you share um, what's best to handle, or what would you share to someone that tends to? want to be that go-getter and just, just just keep life going, but, and they may have a situation where they may, um, you know, mask their pain and um, how is it best to handle that? I would say that the reason why we do that is we don't want to let people down and we, we, we always want to put on a strong thing. We don't want to, well, for me, I didn't ever want to show my weakness to be vulnerable. And I always want to be strong for others because I knew they was worried about me, but, um, I think it comes to a point where we have to learn to take breaks so that we don't put ourselves in a situation where we um, are, at, we're gonna miss something important. So we have to learn how to take breaks and like I said, eliminate the stress because that's important to our bodies to not be stressed out and to not go into crisis. So I would say just um, learning to, you know, just be open, like I said, be open about it. And then just, you know, just don't, you want to master pain because you want to be strong for others, but you have to know when to take breaks. You know, like I, I have this, I'm still trying to find balance. So for me, like you said, go get it. I want to work, 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 work. 
you know, and I could if I every day of the week I want to work because you know I want to be successful and I want to have get all these things accomplished and have my goals and I have, have dreams set out. But then it comes to a point where if I go too much, then I do run the risk of being sick. And so I have to learn when it's take a step back and to rest and let others know that I can't go today. I have to rest. It's just for me because you know my body can't go like yours. So it's finding that balance for you know, rest and then taking care of myself so that I'm not being sick. Thank you so much. So I will just open up the floor to anybody else that has questions for Mr. James Griffin. James, um, this is Ray again, and I have a question Hi, about how you've navigated through the pandemic. How have you found your sense of normalcy again, um, given that you know you uh, are are in a very high risk population? Um, some people are choosing to continue masking. Some people are not. How how are you finding your normalcy in all of that? Okay, so when, when it first when it first broke out, it was staying in contact with others through phone. Uh, uh, a lot of sickle cell organizations had different things. And I think that was helpful just to be able to communicate with people because I was in the house. I didn't want to go out because I didn't want to run the risk of going to the hospital and either catching it from somebody who had it, maybe have may have had COVID or not being able to be seen because I've heard about the people going in and, and hospitals running out of bed. So I made sure to stay inside and take care of myself and treat myself. And I did like things like reading, listen to music, stay active, um, walked around my neighborhood, just exercise, just try to different things to keep it, uh, uh, stay off of emotional, the mindset thing. Um, so that's what I did. And then once it opened up, I wore a mask and I, I didn't do large gatherings. It was just family and it was just or people that I knew was just going to work and coming home and wasn't out there. So I, I try to be as safe as possible when it came to that. I wore my mask everywhere. And now that I'm vaccinated, now I, I don't wear the mask as much um, because I did decide to get vaccinated. I work in a hospital, so I wanted to be safe with that. And just getting back to work helped me be around people and helped me handle the normalcy. And, um, you know, because, no one doesn't want to be alone during this pandemic and we, we're social people, so social beings, so we need to be around others. So I think that work helped me out. I was able to go to work and it gave me opportunities to talk to people and speak to people and see how they would handle it and just have that communication and, and just be around others. But I would say take, yeah, take precautions though, because, you know, I, the, from some people was telling me, oh, it's not, it's not nothing is and then they I found out that they had family members who were getting it and then they started to take it serious so regardless of what you may think is something going on so I I protect myself and I and I stay safe awesome thank you yeah anyone else have any questions Well, James, I just have to say thank you so much for being just that wealth of knowledge and sharing. Um, we definitely um, enjoyed this, this forum and being able to um, speak with you. And your book is available on Amazon. I must say it's a great book. Thank <laughs> great you. in the silence. And um, we definitely, um, definitely learned a lot today. And especially when we think about our male community that we want to encourage to get more involved, to talk and be able to um, continue the advocacy journey. Um, I just thank you for taking the time to, to realize that it's so important to speak and break the silence of sickle cell and join in the advocacy movement. I know we were at Capitol Hill um, yes. prior to um, COVID hitting in 2020. So um, there's so much work to be done. And I want to encourage you to continue your journey and continue that, that voice of advocacy and resilience that, that, we, that we so need in this community. So thank you for joining us. You can hang on on um, with us or if you need to go we respect that and um, I just want to take this time to tell everyone we're just going to take a five minute break 
and then we'll come back again and um, just take your time to um, reflect that we are here as a advocacy um, group in order to bring a voice and just bring more awareness to sickle cell. I thank you for joining us and we will be back in about five minutes. Thank you for having me too on your platform. You're welcome. I like what you're doing. And I think this, this helps support others who don't have that support. So uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Yes. If you don't mind, James, on the chat, putting how we can get, um, other than Amazon, the autographed copy of your book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how we can get the, you know, autographed by you, um, although you mentioned Amazon, um, but definitely how we can get the book through you. Okay, I will do that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. James, I think you're still unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry.
Welcome everyone. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I will just have time, let little time for people to join back in. Ms. Carla, I must say, I love your necklaces all the time. You, you oh, thank you. Mother. <laughs> thank you so I, much. I showed my mom your pictures. Um, and I said, I have to, you know, hopefully you'll be receiving your, your thank you gift soon. And <laughs> I told my mom, it has to be like you bold, you know, and I showed her a couple of pictures of the, the statements you wear. And I said, you're both the same. Whatever is louder, the louder, the better. <laughs> Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> it is so beautiful. It's like, I keep the same, my same on. So it's like, um, I have what my father had given um, my mother this necklace to, to ask her for it, to go on a date when they first met. The second is my grandmother. She went to Jerusalem and got me um, a hamsa and for protection and then the last one was like a gift to myself so that's what I always stay on but I always tell my mom if you and Carla were to meet <laughs> you would both share the wardrobe <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you yes you're right you're right she's definitely that that diva that I look up to <laughs> yeah. Hey. Welcome back. So now we will have a video presentation, symptoms and complications of sickle cell disease, the importance of early detection and treatment. And this is gonna be brought to you by Mennock USA. And I will be, ooh, we got, I will be um, sharing that video. Please let me know if you can see it and hear it. I can see it, but I can't hear it. So when you do your share screen, there's a there's a button down at the bottom that that it, it's a clickable box where you'll have to click um, to tell it to share that sound. Okay. So unshare, and then go back into and then click share again. And before you click which screen, down at the bottom, you see that little box that says to share your other sound. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Ray. You're welcome. We learned through experience of this Zoom experience, right? <laughs> Listen up, you may have heard a lot about sickle cell anemia in your lifetime, but let me tell you something, you are gonna get the real deal today. So come take this ride with me. You see, this is how it starts. Sickle cell anemia is a rare genetic blood disorder. That means that for a child to develop sickle cell anemia, both parents must pass on a sickle cell gene to their child. One in 12 African Americans carry a sickle cell gene. Hispanic Americans and people of Middle Eastern descent Asian descent, Indian descent, and Mediterranean descent can carry it too. That's why sickle cell anemia is more common with these groups of people. There are around 100,000 people in the United States with sickle cell anemia. But what is sickle cell anemia? I mean, really? The term sickle cell comes from the shape of the red blood cells. You see, red blood cells are usually disc-shaped. They bend very easy so they can easily get into small blood vessels. However, if you have sickle cell anemia, your red blood cells are shaped like a half moon or like a sickle. 
Sickle-shaped red blood cells break open more easily than healthy red blood cells, and they can't live as long, which means that you don't have enough red blood cells, and this is why you get the anemia. Sickled red blood cells are also harder and stickier than healthy red blood cells. Combined with their sickle shape, this can cause them to clog blood flow, leading to a lot of serious health problems. Talk to a healthcare provider that you trust so that you can learn more about sickle cell anemia. Thank you for joining us, and good afternoon or good evening. Okay, I am going to, that was actually supposed to be a, a longer video, so <clears throat> let's hold on a second, let me look. It's on several series. I know we watched in our our last um, one, we watched presentation. So hold on one second. While we are waiting, um, I wanted to go into our first trivia question. So one second. <laughs> so our first trivia question what year was sickle cell disease first discovered in the u.s You can type it in the chat. And for an extra bonus, what was the patient's name? How oh, nice. <laughs> I feel like we should have Jeopardy music. I know, I know. <laughs> I hear it in my head. <laughs> Any takers? Ray, can you see the chat? I sure can. Okay. All right. It looks like Sarai. Sarai, you were first and you are correct. In 1910 was the first. It was first described in a medical journal. Very good. Um, so you got the answer to that. The added bonus came from Francesca. Very good. It was Walter. Um, it was, well, it wasn't Walter Noel, actually. Um, almost right. Shirley, you are correct. It is, it, it, well, Walter was the first name, but yes, Walter Clement Noel. So you both were correct. Francesca, you were first. Um, he was from the Caribbean island of Granada. And he was, a, he was actually a dental student. And he was found to have these odd crescent-shaped cells. 
And, um, and that began the journey that we are still on to better understanding sickle cell disease. So I believe that the more you know about the, not just the disease and how it works, but the history of the disease. And it really helps to understand the path that we are on and how we get to our cure. Um, sickle cell disease is, is one of the most intriguing um, genetic diseases that is be, has been studied over the years. And in fact, it has unlocked a great deal of understanding to the whole genome process. So genetic, um, the study of genetics. And so it is, um, it's an amazing disease. And when, if you ever have time to just kind of study some of the science of it, it's a fun, um, it's, it's something fun to dig into as well. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you so much. So Sarai, you have won the prize of getting one of James's book, Breaking the Silence to Sickle Cell. So that will be mailed to you. Thank you, Sarai, for joining us. And we will now tune in to um, another video. Um, I was trying to actually get the selection of four, but um, we will see how this turns out. <laughs> We've covered doctor visits, vaccinations, and lifestyle recommendations, but what about treatment and medications? Why, when, and how should your child be treated? Sickle cell anemia can lead to painful symptoms and serious health complications affecting all of the major organs of your child's body. Not only do these lower your child's quality of life, they also reduce their life expectancy. When bone marrow transplant, the only potential cure for sickle cell anemia is not available to sickle cell anemia patients, treatment is aimed at relieving symptoms as well as preventing painful episodes and complications that may arise further down the road. You may feel you want to wait until a painful episode occurs before giving your child medication. But managing sickle cell disease is as much about preventing painful episodes and complications as it is about relieving symptoms. Why wait for something bad to happen when you can do something now? Overall, experts believe there's no reason to wait when it comes to treating sickle cell disease. Regular doctor checkups can begin as soon as your child is diagnosed. To help prevent infections that may arise because of sickle cell anemia, antibiotics may be prescribed to babies as young as two months old. Also, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has approved various prescription products currently indicated to treat children with sickle cell anemia. Mom and dad, please ask your doctor about these treatment options. Ask which one will help your child to live better and longer. These should be your top two criteria when picking the right treatment for your child. Thank you. So um, when we think about treatments and treatment options, it's so important for us to know that there is a selection of treatments for um, just preventative care. And then also, um, as Dr. Ware stated, being conscious of um, our, our nutrition and, and how we give our body rest. Um, I love the fact that we have um, dedicated um, pharma um, suitable companies that are are invested in not only learning about sickle cell, educating um, others um, pretty much on on what their drive is, but also connecting with the advocacy world and also being able to provide an outlet for um, our warriors to actually speak about their experience in caregivers. It's so important to also include the community. So I, I thank you for actually joining us um, again. And I'm gonna take this time because we are going to go on a, a 10 minute break. Um, before our, our discussion circle that we have Nil Nilda joining us in our discussion circle. And we'll be um, talking more on treatment options and, and healthy living. 
So I welcome you back in about 10 minutes. That time we will come back around 1020. We'll join back to speak and um, join our um, discuss discussion circle. So I wanna take this time just for to let you know that we are available and I'm going to, before we um, leave, I'm going to put our contact in, we'll have our contact information up. And um, as this is recording, we wanna make sure we definitely are continued resource for the community. So I'll see you back in 10 minutes.
Welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Thank you for joining back with us as we prepare for our, um, our circle of discussion. Um, I'm going to um, just take the time to thank you for joining us and welcome and welcome and welcome you back. I am going to share my screen as we have another trivia question. And Ray, could you read the question? <laughs> I sure will. Okay. The next question is what does TCD stand for and what is it? Let's see who knows this one. TCD. If you have sickle cell, you've probably had one of these or a few of these, what does it stand for and what is it? I can be the Alex Trebek music. Do, 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 do. We have something going in the chat. Yeah. Um, hello, human. Be kind. First and foremost, I love that you're using that name. I think that that is so amazing. <laughs> Who are you? What is your name so that we can identify you? Oh, good morning, uh, Renee Kirby. Hello, Renee. I love that. That just made me smile oh, <laughs> inside and out. So I love it. Very good. And what is a transcranial Doppler? Uh, for what I can remember, this is, um, I'm in my 40s now, but <laughs> um, it's, uh, I would say like the, the, the instrument you use to give yourself an ultrasound, but on your head. Yes, yes. And why do they do that in sickle cell? Uh, do you check for, um, let me think, let me think. Um, I want to say strokes. That's exactly right. Exactly. It's an ultrasound of the small blood vessels in the brain, and it is screening for stroke risk. So that way they can tell if your blood is flowing too fast through those small blood vessels, it's called a TR jet. And if it's too high, um, that can put you at greater risk for stroke. So very good. <laughs> very good. The gray, the gray matter is still working. Yes, right. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And typically, typically um, children with sickle cell disease receive TCDs between the ages of two and 16 when they say that they are at highest risk for stroke. But we all know that stroke does happen even beyond age 16. So it's important to still know the signs of Can stroke. <laughs> That's okay. So it's important to still know the signs of stroke and to be aware and still having those conversations with your hematologist. So well done. Hello, humans. Be kind. Uh, and Carla, would you tell her what her prize is today? Put you, whoop, you just muted. You're muted. Got to get used to that on Zoom. So you've also won the prize of breaking the silence with sickle cell. Thank you so much for joining us and congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you so much um, for providing that information for us um, on trans Dopplers. So it's so important as we know that the testing is um, is, is very, very important for those that's in pediatric care, as well as, um, as, as soon as the, the, it, 
they, they had stopped at a time when it was um, like 16 years old at some clinics, um, but some clinics um, continue that on at, and, and as they are 16. And when you, when you transfer over to 17 at the beginning, I give you, they give you one and then that's it. Um, and pretty much kind of change measurements. So every clinic kind of does it different, but um, it's so important for us to know and so, so important for parents to follow up and understand the importance of that test. So thank you, Ray, for, for sharing that. And now we have Nilda joining us. I will share my screen one second. So thank you everyone for staying aboard with us. Our discussion now will be our circle of discussion on treatment options and healthy habits. So, so we are thankful to have Nilda Novato um, to join us right now. And um, I'm having a little issue with my phone, so which I had everything um, on. So um, Nilda, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. I am, so I normally start the introduction by saying I am Hispanic living with sickle cell, as many of the faces of um, Latin culture are not highlighted as much um, with um, our illness, but I am 44 years of age. I am originally um, from New York, and I now reside in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have a total of 11 complications that stem from sickle cell. Um, I have SS and one of my main ones aside, I always say sickle cell right now is like the tomato sauce of my lasagna. It's the most important ingredient, but not, not the one that is overpowering my, my health. Um, I have pulmonary hypertension and that is one have been one of my main struggles. Um, living with sickle cell is pulmonary hypertension and avascular necrosis. I have um, majority of my joints replace it, replaced and I have one knee that is starting to collapse. So that will be my final um, joint replacement in the near future. I work with Sickle Cell Partners of the Carolinas and I am currently with um, Ms. Shirley Miller as I am in the Insights Council of Pharma Therapeutics. And I am in a learning committee of ASH as we are trying to remap some of the guidelines for sickle cell and focusing on transition as well as emergency department protocols, which that is right now um, a passion of mine since that is where we all kind of um, deal with most of the I don't want to say malpractice, but mistreatment when it comes to sickle cell to being heard and being um, seen as a patient and not be judged um, by what is learned in regards to our community. And during the pandemic, we started a group in WhatsApp, which is linked with a lot of Latin America um, countries as the form of, of communication aside from Facebook. And it started with a group of 15 members, which it's now grown to 86 participants and it is both patients and their families. So it is a support group as many patients that are new to learning that their child was born to sickle cell, it becomes a method of support for both the families and the patients. And the majority of the patients are from Venezuela, Colombia, and Dominican Republic. And then we have a few that are now kind of coming into the group which is Ecuador, Honduras, and Puerto Rico. So that is something that I have taken a, a value for, especially that although the pandemic shut us down, it has opened the doors for us to connect and see the many faces of sickle cell and have and um, create a, a personal connection, I believe, aside from the social media realms. You know, we are now 
having com communication, having these conversations, having important webinars, um, which highlight the life of a patient as well as some of their healthy habits, as you say, for living with sickle cell. And one of my many advocacy is the juicing. I promote a lot of juicing for sickle cell. I, I used to be a patient that one of my medications was a long-term 60 milligram Oxycontin, which is a very high dose. You know, at the time I had seen a physician and they said, you're probably on a cancer protocol when it comes to pain. So I changed my method of eating. My, I started to drink my vegetables. So I'll be honest, as an adult, I do not like vegetables. <laughs> so I drink them. <laughs> and it has actually turned my life around. So it is one of the many methods of me living um, in wellness. And like the doctor at the beginning of the presentation, he had mentioned herbs. Herbs are very much part of my life. So Mr. Dr. Ware gave a lot of insight to the importance of, of healthy habits, sleeping. And that is definitely what I say thank you as it was a change that I took personally and it has turned my life around with dealing with our illness. So I thank you for having me part of your presentation today. Thank you so much, Nilda. I appreciate that, um, just sharing the introduction about yourself. Um, just to share just a little bit more, Nilda is a patient advocate that has been in the trenches for a while and not only given a voice to let people know that um, sickle cell has no indication of color, who, it's, who it impacts. Um, she shares um, her, her, her education and her compassion with the community that is um, the Hispanic community that's also living with sickle cell, not only here, but abroad. And it's so important for us to be that united voice when it comes to sickle cell to let everyone know they're not alone. So I thank you, Nilda. Nilda have spoken on, on behalf of the community to legislators as well as, well as um, showing up at national events, the um, National Sickle Cell Association of America um, convention, um, which we have um, actually uh, met in person at. Um, so it's a pleasure to definitely have you and have you be a part of this discussion. Um, I will jump right in and um, just say that um, we had a great presentation from Dr. Weir and we, we spoke about um, health and wellness and, and how it takes a, a part of your um, toll on the body. You mentioned Nilda that um, you also have other diagnosis and we know that comes with sickle cell um, disorder. Usually um, patients have um, some under, other underlying complications that tends to come have unfortunately bring on another diagnosis. So I want you to share how has um, just the change of, of diet um, has have impacted you and, and when did you make that change? When did you decide that that's important? Um, and how, how did that start come? How did that come about in your life? My grandmother and um, I think she transitioned and I think I would say she would be very proud of me current day and I don't want to get emotional, but um, <laughs> since young, she's always forced the carrots, beets, and as an adult, I've, I've become very lethargic having sickle cell and then developing pulmonary hypertension. Um, I was sleeping a lot and it just came to this point where it's just, I might as well be dead if I'm sleeping this much. And it kind of hit home to just feel like I need to change my life around. I need to change my habits. I hear my family doing things, working, getting up. And I used to be such an active person um, when I was younger and in my 20s, I, I worked. I used to get up to go to the gym. Then I went to my job. Then I went to school at night. And then I even had time to probably 
to hang around with friends in the middle of the night. And I said, who is that girl? Where has that girl gone? Um, and after my, my grandmother passed away, I was very frightened because my grandmother was the rock of the family. She's the one that um, my mom would just melt. When there was a sickle cell episode or I was in the hospital, many people would say, why is Carmen at work? And she used work as a distraction. It was very hard for her as a parent. And then um, my grandmother was it's her best friend. They were both born, um, my grandmother had 10 children. Uh, my mom was the only girl and it was the gift to her on her birthday. So they had the same birthday. So it was a, a, a big hit, but it was also a reminder to me that now our, um, my sister and I are now my mom's best friends because um, she had lost her mother. And that is where I said, I have to get out of this bed. I have to change my life. I used to work and I then was disabled. And it was one of the hardest lessons in my life. I, my doctor said, you have to become selfish. You have to become selfish with yourself. And it was the hardest lesson to teach myself. But now I've adapted to it. I started incorporating the teachings from young. So still to this day, I may pinch my nose and drink those vegetables, but it has helped me in regards to energy. It has helped me in regards to raising my blood count. And I have, I will share with you, I have, I started a YouTube channel and it's called A Sickle Rose. And on there, I started uploading the juices that I do and the benefits on how it helps uh, our illness. When I used beets, I remember going to the physician and having a CBC done and my blood was like at about 12.1. And it was like a child at kindergarten putting the lab results on a fridge because I saw that I, my range was normal. But then I learned that sickness is not beneficial to sickle cell. So when I teach persons about juicing, I let them know let your physician know that you're starting this because although it is healthy, it can also bring risk. Mm. So it is very important to do a CBC before and after. So I always say, let your doctor know, make the appointment, get a CBC, do beats for a week and you will learn how it affects your blood count. For me, I learned that I have to do it every other day. I can't do it consistently because it raises my blood to a level that is not healthy. So every other day, and then what I do is that in the in-between days, I do juicing that benefits my other complications. So when it comes to pulmonary hypertension, I use um, celery, watercress. These are vegetables that have anti-inflammatory benefits to them that are good for flushing out toxins, um, especially the liver. And going back to when I mentioned my grandmother, she would always do a solve that would sit in the fridge. And I knew that when I was getting that spoon, it's to get me better. And I said, oh, I remember this taste. So it consists of aloe, red onion, radish, and honey. And what you do is that you kind of cut the aloe into cubes. You wash, you wash the aloe. You can either juice the radish or you can leave it as slices and have it as an appetizer with the aloe and it's red onion and honey. That sits in your fridge and you can have it after the third day. So once you mix the ingredients up, after the third day, you can start having it as a syrup or you can have it as an appetizer. So my family likes to eat the aloe and the, the radishes. And I had a friend that was in nursing and he had seen that I had done this and posted it on Facebook. And he said, listen, I recently a nurse. I'm really terrified of starting to work right now. He's asthmatic and he ended up doing 
and using the same recipe, one of them, he included garlic. And I said, don't do garlic because number one, breath, even though it has a lot of benefits. So I said, he learned his lesson. He said, you're right. I will not do the garlic again, but he did others with ginger and turmeric and it's really helped him out. So he's noticed a change um, in his asthma. And I think that's when you really notice how nature is healing. Same as Dr. Ware said, these are the natural elements. These are the items that we, it's earth. It is items that our grandparents used, our ancestors. When it comes to having a background and my roots are Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, we cook with yuca, which in the Caribbean islands, it's also known as cassava. And there are elements of cassava root in hydroxyurea. So there are, I can do some more research to tell you which elements they took out of the yucca root and they incorporated it into hydroxyurea. And I learned about yucca from a physician at Brady in Emory down in Atlanta. He used to sell a yucca extract when I was having issues with my joints. And I then did more research and I noticed how beneficial it is. So I eat it, whether it's boiled, I love them fried, but we all know fried food is not the best for us. <laughs> so you know, we boil it, we fry it, um, and we pretty much eat it with onions, olive oil. Um, and yucca is very beneficial to, to sickle cell as well. So it's basically changing your diet to incorporate more healthy. And while, while the presentations were going, I kept getting up because I was like, oh, hold on, let me mention this. So I wanted to share with you all, when you ask the gentleman, what is his, um, how does he keep up with his medications? So I keep this bag in my nightstand and I generally, every month, I take all my medications and I put it all in a Ziploc in the, the little pill packs from the pharmacy. And I do them each month and it includes what I take. So I take hydroxyurea, folic acid. I have nerve issues. So it includes my medications for my nerves. I have to take the aspirin 81. So everything that I take for the day is in here. And I will share with you, this was my, this was my pill pain pack. So this is all pain pills. This goes from the minimal, that is your Motrin's to muscle relaxers, to my short-term, long-term, and then the, the, the stronger pain medicine. And this is a reminder to where I used to basically have a map to all of this. And Unfortunately, I had to return it in my life because of the pandemic. I had to make sure I had my long acting medication, my short acting medication in order to reduce the risk of being hospitalized and manage my health. But I reduced it all to one. So I have eliminated all of these narcotics. But what I will mention to you is that growing up, I was not introduced to narcotics until after I was 18. So I've always had to endure the sickle cell pain as a, as a child, as a young adult. I've always depended on ointments and ointments were always my go-to, the green alcohol. We all know the green alcohol. <laughs> and these are things that, that were part of my, my upbringing with sickle cell, camphor. So it is all of those natural healing ointments that I depended on. And then at the age of 19, my health declined. And I went on to receiving narcotics. Then I wouldn't say a dependency, but I was having so many issues with my joints that it was a daily, I would have to take med medication daily when I wake up during the day, the long acting. And then I, I noticed this is not who I was for 19 years. I grew up without all of this. So I took myself back to depending on the home remedies and the changing of my, my eating habits. And 
also incorporating exercise, which is not something that we can all do, but it takes one day at a time. I often tell persons with our illness, we're not in a race. We are not to compare ourselves to anyone. And you can build yourself to be able to do so. If you want to walk, you walk. You walk to your mailbox. Then you walk the distance of a home. If you live in an apartment building, you go down a flight of stairs, you go up one floor. And little by little, you just increase it at a time. And your body will start gaining it, it will start creating the strength, the inner strength. It becomes a habit. So mentally, you might say, I didn't get to go to the gym today. And it kind of gets frustrating because you've created that habit to, to work out. And it becomes part of your schedule. And there are certain things that you have to put as must-dos because it's very easy to say, I'm going to stay in bed. So even if you're in bed, you can pull up yoga and there's um, chair yogas that you can do. And it actually benefits, the, the technique of breathing benefits. So I, as I was listening to, to the presentations, I kind of go, oh, wait, let me go to the fridge. Let me go get this. And in regards to probiotics, I use um, chia seeds and it has probiotics and it sits in the fridge. And I figure I need to make a presentation or a video to include like, what are my routines? Chia seeds is a natural, it's a digestive. And what it does is many people can put it on their salads. And what I do is that I take a quarter cup into a cup of water. And I keep a, a Tupperware in my fridge. So it's a cup of water to a cup, a quarter cup of chia seeds. And I'll just show you what it does is that it coats the seeds. Um, it has like a gel, like, I'm not sure if you can see it. It has like a gel texture around it. And that helps. And the reason I mentioned this to you is because I had many digestive issues, which with being on the pain medication and in the hospital, you don't go home until you have a bowel movement and chia seeds helps. It has helped me with, um, with my digestive system. I have what's called, um, I have to follow what's called a FODMAP diet, which is when your intestines do not absorb carbohydrates well. So I pretty much go from having a, a stomach that you would, many people are like, oh, congratulations, you're expecting. And I'm like, no, I'm a foodie. And it doesn't offend me. <laughs> it doesn't at all. And the chia seeds have helped because what it does is when you see that coating, it coats um, to have everything move and cleans out your intestinal walls. And when persons, I don't think many people know that when you do incorporate chia seeds, you have to hydrate a lot because it does stick to the walls if you do not properly hydrate. And hydrate is very important for persons with sickle cell anemia, but I will be honest, I know that majority, and I am one of them, I will admit, sometimes I do not drink the amount of water that I should. Um, many of us may have reminders, we buy as many things to help us, a 15 minute reminder cup, a jug, but sometimes we just do not take the sips that we're supposed to take. And that's why I recommend hydrating the chia seeds because you don't want something that's beneficial to you to become a complication. So it's best hydrate it with water and you can add it to your yogurt, to juice. Um, I usually add it to yogurt since I make yogurt another daily must with my, um, with my eating. So I'm sorry that I extended it so long, Ms. Carla, but um, these are just little things that I do incorporate daily and it is water. And in regards to herbs, I drink a lot of tea. And a lot of teas are my gingers, moringa. Um, I drink a lot of peppermint tea and peppermint oils help with migraines. So I have many complications that deal in a neurological, in the neurological area, because I do suffer from sleep paralysis, which is when your mind wakes up before your body. So you feel a heaviness on your chest because 
when we fall asleep, the mind tells the body to shut down so that number one, we don't hurt ourselves and we breathe differently when we sleep. So when you have sleep paralysis and you wake up and you feel like someone is on your chest, there is usually this feeling of a negative presence in your room and it's because you can't move. And what they say is that your mind wakes up before your body's been signaled to wake up. And so um, due to that, I use a lot of aromatherapy. Valerian tea is a good um, sleeping aid for sleeping. And I do a lot of aromatherapy type of lotions. So anything with lavender, they have Dr. Teal's has now a lavender and melatonin bath. So that is kind of soothing before you go to bed. So these are little, little things that I incorporate into my daily lifestyle that help with me having our chronic illness and then the many complications that have come with it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, one of the things that you have mentioned is that um, you do also incorporate um, teas um, that will be able to, to, to assist and help you. And you mentioned your, your family that have been um, very essential to educating you about your health and have been a, been a support to you on this journey of sickle cell. One of the things that I remember that you had mentioned is not until that you wasn't introduced to narcotics, um, not until you was older. Um, can you share, was that related to um, just a family preference or um, culture, or was it just related to um, just, just, just the medical community not offering um, that as a treatment? What, what was the... Um, the delay, or I would say the, the choice of, of later um, being introduced to narcotics. Yeah, and honestly- As a treatment. I, I honestly do not know the exact reasons why. I, I was introduced to narcotics when I moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina. So I used to be a patient of Dr. Doris Weathers in New York. And she had taught us many things on the language on growing up with sickle cell, um, the, the, um, the um, kind of the go-to, so the, the heating pads, the hydration. And I cannot say that I remember taking other pill, any other pills other than penicillin. So it was pen BK and folic acid. Those were my pills growing up. I feel that when I was in the hospital, it was a much dependency on the fluids and it could be family. I had a cousin that, that had sickle cell. She passed away at the age of 20. Uh, I was 18 at the time. We were the only two with sickle cell in our family. And when it came to us having pain, it was a lot of what I mentioned, which is the ointment. And this is all I pretty much knew and grew up on was the camphors, arnica, the, um, the tiger balms. The, mm -hmm. So there's a liquid, the liquid version. So these are elements that were part of my pain management. Even when I went to a child's camp, we had a bag that just had everything that we used for pain. It was never really a pill. And I believe also what I might say is culturally, I, we come from a home where you don't speak outside of your walls. So sickle cell was very much an illness in which was not, everyone knew that Carmen had a sickly child, but to know what sickle cell was and um, to have a community of sickle cell, I, it's not like it is now. I think social media has given a lot of education, especially children now know how to describe what they have. I did not as a child. I had friends that would say I had a heart problem. And I myself was like, I have a heart problem. <laughs> so it's like when I was older, I was like, oh no, this is what I have. But it's not what children know nowadays where I find it such a blessing that we have young advocates 
that are advocating for their health that tell their friends what they have or tell their friends, look, if I get sick, um, you know, call mom hospital, I need water. But growing up, it was more about soaking and um, like I said, uh, enduring and waiting for these creams to take an effect. And my cousin and I, it was just us that would talk to each other about what we go through. But we, I can't tell you that thinking about it right now, I can't say that it was a hospital or it was a neglect. It's just, honestly, it wasn't part of our regimen. And I feel maybe it is the culture, you know, the, there's a lot of natural healing that comes growing up and, and what is known in the Caribbean to use for pain. So it, it would be not having a support as a community to probably know the go-tos for a sickle cell. And it's also uh, the family. It's also, you know, overcome it with what we know. Thank you so much. I will open it up to the floor to ask you questions or ask questions. Um, anyone have any questions? So I do. I have lots of questions always, <laughs> um, but <laughs> I want to start out. You talked about not necessarily, you knew that you had sickle cell disease. You didn't, there wasn't a whole lot of detailed conversation in your home growing up. Can you speak to how you feel like, like, um, you know, sheltering you from some of those, those details was helpful and then how that may have been hurtful as well to your journey with sickle cell? I think hurtful. Um, if I, if I, so when you start writing and I'm, I'm starting to write my story, and as I write, I'm learning more about myself and my upbringing. I think it would have been beneficial to let my friends know, but I think it would have been much more beneficial for me to know exactly what was going on in my body. Because I remember having the exchange transfusions. I remember missing a lot of the family events, but for me to pinpoint what was sickle cell at the time, no, not at all. I feel that there is a reserve that occurred. And if I were to revisit the, the past, would I have changed? Yes, as probably doing the education as far as my classmate. But at the same time, many people did not understand sickle cell. So even, even when I dated, um, it was, is it a contagious? Many people were not aware of what it was. So it's like, we don't share this. So it was kind of, I wouldn't say a secret per se between my cousin and I, but it was just the, the close friends that we had. They knew why I go into the hospital. They knew to watch over me, but it wasn't as a community. And I feel that I wish I would have, if I were to go back, I would definitely educate on what is sickle cell and let it be known that it is not an illness to be afraid of. But at the same time, it did cause a lot of missed events. So it still, it's, it was a very solitary journey. Even when I mourned um, the loss of my cousin, it, it still felt like a lonely journey because I didn't expose myself I wasn't exposed to a community of sickle cell until social media. And in social media is also where I learned that many people say I was told I was not gonna live up to a certain age. I experienced death at a young age. So I experienced death of my grandfather, my uncle. So I, I, I dealt with many different ways of a person dying. So I never saw sickle cell to be a death sentence attached to, to the illness. And I was exposed to that during Facebook and, and before it, in my space where a person would say happy birthday, but they would always mention, I was told I wouldn't live towards a certain age. And I didn't grow up with that train of thought. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a positive and negative effect uh, of knowing sickle cell and maybe not knowing the full not having the full picture of sickle cell, because if I would have had that limitation growing up, I probably wouldn't have put myself to the risk that I took and the things that I did and 
one of my passions is traveling and I probably wouldn't have exposed myself to traveling if I had all these little do you know not do's growing up with sickle cell you are speaking so much truth because in my experiences um being part of the medical team you know I talk to to families all the time you know how you cope will will transfer into how that child copes and how you believe the hope that you have um, in life and the experiences of just living life that you have again will be reflected in that child and so when you're not giving them those limitations when you focus on all the things they can do right versus focusing on the things that they can't or the things that they're going to do differently it you create a different mindset um, in that child who will one day be an adult they forget you, you know your child with sickle cell won't be a child forever they will one day be an adult with sickle cell and so um, as we reshape and relearn and understand how we empower children with sickle cell, right? It's about those age appropriate ways that we're talking about sickle cell. So I really, I really love um, the way that that you are presenting your story and, and your experiences in your home. And yes, we all know what happens in the house stays in the house. You, we don't go outside and talk about that. Um, but we're also shredding this stigma that's attached to it so that people understand and see our humanity um, and not just our illness. So kudos to you. Um, my other question that I wanted to follow up with is really centered around the Hispanic community. I agree, sickle cell um, does not do a great job of making sure that we see all the faces of sickle cell. Um, some of that is, I just kind of call that this Americanized privilege of it's just, you know, it's just us and we. Now it's not, our, our we is just us and people who look like us, but it's not, it's so much bigger than that. And there are just a Enough. We have so many similarities and there's far more things that bring us together than the things that separate us, but we do have differences in culture um, that are important to understanding how culturally, um, you know, your, how your community um, comes together around, um, you know, family illnesses or an individual's illnesses. How have you used that to do more advocacy within the Hispanic community? Yeah, so I primarily was focusing on blood donation and bone marrow. For World Sickle Cell Day, I did a slideshow to show the faces of sickle cell that were Hispanic. And I have Sarai in the, the video because she's Puerto Rican. So we have the commonality and it's amazing. Oh, how uh, yeah, I'm Puerto Rican and West Indian and I'm also Afro-Indigenous and Afro-Caribbean. So yeah, yeah. I just tell everybody that describe who I am. Well, I'm sorry, no, that's to cut you off. But in our community as Hispanics, we don't barely talk about it. And especially I'm in an indigenous community. We don't barely talk about that either and the Afro community, because my father is Afro-Taino, but we don't use that term Taino much. We use indigenous. Now I'm being educated more on that. And my mom is, um, she's Puerto Rican, but she's West Indian also. Her ancestors all came to migrate from Puerto Rico. So basically in our cultures, we don't barely talk about it when we was growing up. They just say, oh, that's some surprise. Yeah, she's always sick all the time and this and that. But now since my cousins and everybody, we all got together, I kicked out a lot of family members because y'all disrespected me. But few of my family members, um, they accept me for who I am in the sickle cell community because they always see my post that I'm doing this in the sickle cell community. They see me, I'm in the health fairs at such and such streets. They be like, oh, wow, Brima, you're always doing your thing. Oh, so right, you always do your stuff. So I was like, yeah, we need to be educated in the, especially in the indigenous community and in the, and in the Caribbeans because a lot of need to be known about it, especially the Bronx is more, you know, more population with Africans, with, um, with Dominican Republic, with Honduras, and the Bronx is a lot of, South Bronx has been affecting more with sickle cell because of the, how you may say, the immigration. So it's good. I congratulate Nelda on your work. You continue to do you as much as you can, you know, be the best you. And congratulations to Ray and Carla. You guys are amazing. Keep doing these events because these events are very good and I've been educating more. Kudos to you so I have, um, thank you. And I thank have um, partnered with 
Dr. Savitt, because he did the history on sickle cell when he wrote his book on medicine and slavery. And there are a lot of questions when a person asks, still to this day, I am 44, and still to this day, if I'm in the hospital, is, oh, I didn't know that Hispanics have sickle cell. And to me, it is still mind blowing, especially, you know, there is a mix of culture there. Um, many persons are still question, and, and I find it surprising that a medical person in the medical realm has asked me on sickle cell and it running in Hispanics. So when I was younger, I did, I was on the bone marrow registry for about 15 years. And the way I advocate to Hispanics is donation of blood donation, as well as bone marrow registry, because I find that to be a reason why I did not receive a chance of being cured. Many persons in our community do not donate. They do not register. There's this backwards mentality of if they know you are in the hospital, they know that you get sick, that you have an illness, but they truly don't understand what the illness is. But then if you mention to them that it can be cured for some reason, it, it puts up this, this flag of, I can be your cure. And that's how they get involved. So it's like, I could be your cure, what can I do? And that is how we involve our community to then say, look, if, even if you might not help me per se, it can help someone else. And in regards to blood donation, there is less risk of building all these antibodies if we receive from persons that are connected, that are of our, you know, similar background. United States, we are blessed with having so many, so much blood donation. However, majority of the blood donation is Caucasian. So if we have our community donate, it is less of that percentage because I feel we have a lot of persons on chronic transfusion treatment. And although you think in a sense, well, what can I do right now to live my wellness at this moment, they do not um, actually bring out what can be the risk as you becoming as an adult, that your blood may take, you know, I have friends that their blood takes like two weeks to find because they have been on these chronic transfusion treatments. And although it's been beneficial and they've lived a, a, a life of wellness, it is also increasing these um, inner kind of roadblocks that are building. So yes, you do receive, but at the same time, what's gonna happen when you are an adult? And that's why I tell persons, like please get the importance of having persons donate within your culture is essential because it's not only a lifeline, but it's a lifeline that can be extended for me to have a positive adult life living with sickle cell and then bone marrow. In 15 years that I was in the registry, there is one person that showed up with three out of the seven typings. And that wasn't enough for me. It was too risky at the time. Half match donation was not something that was as known as it is right now. So when I did my search for bone marrow, it was still at a time where the half match was very high risk and chemo was very aggressive. And it wasn't an option that I could have taken at the time. I told my family, I have so many complications with this illness. I've learned to live with it, even though bone marrow will stop it from progressing. It's not going to appear these complications. So I'm okay with how I am right now and, and living with sickle cell until, until God chooses that it's my time. We were raised to know, you know, faith and family have been my number one support. And God has our story written. So what I need to do is listen, listen to his messages, whatever roadblocks I get, I deal with them. It's part of my journey. And then I just try to move forward with the life that I've been given. You're phenomenal. I just love you so much. You are such an encouragement to the community and your perspective um, and your positive attitude. Doesn't mean that you haven't had difficult days, painful days, obviously, um, but the mindset that you've developed within your journey um, not only speaks um, um, blessings to those who are living with sickle cell disease, but it also speaks blessings to caregivers and families of those who are impacted by this disease. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I love you all because 
Miss Ray, you, Miss Carla, surely of all that is an advocate still working. Like yes. the majority of us would say, I'm retired, I'm good, you know? And she continues to work and show that you can work, you can succeed, you, you can um, live a life of wellness. You know, you see her and it could be early in the morning and Miss Shirley is just wide-eyed, ready to share herself. <laughs> You know, she's written a book and it's it's amazing to read her journey as well. And I always advise parents when I used to speak and in, 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 in functions that we would hold locally with parents, I would tell parents, try not to place your child in a bubble because they will learn what their limitations are. My mom constantly, it doesn't matter what age I am, she would always tell me, you need your sweater. Are you feeling okay? Like yesterday, I started seeing stars because the sun came out of nowhere and I was doing garden work. And she's like, I told you not to do this. You shouldn't be. And I said, I have to. Like, I have to maintain my home. Like, the weeds are going to come out of the woodworks if I don't do anything. But I have to. But I have to also say, okay, I have to get up earlier to do it when the sun is not so powerful. But we need, we learn what our limits are. So when a child wants to do track or run, um, they will learn how much they can do at a time. And they need to speak with their counsels, their teachers to let them know that, hey, I might need to sit. When you have everyone running around in laps, I need to sit and take a break and I need water. And that's okay. Like, it's like I said, you're not in this race and you can do, but it's at a slower rate. So same as I said at the beginning that I'm very am animated, it's like the road runner. You have Wiley Coyote, you have the road runner and they always kind of showed, or was it a turtle? The turtle finished the race. He might've finished last, but he finished. <laughs> and it's that same thought that it's the speed is, it's, it's for ourselves. I, it took me a long time to finish my bachelor's. And that's because I, I had to, I repeated some courses that I had to withdraw from. And I say, I'm not in a competition. I didn't graduate with my class and that's okay. We can all be there for each other, but it was completed. And even though it wasn't probably when I was 21, it, yes, I, I def, of course, I definitely would have loved it to be that way. But there are things that played a part where I had to take a break. And then I returned to my studies and I was still able to accomplish it. And even when you see now persons in the news that maybe someone that was 82 years old received their bachelor's or their master's, it, that's okay. The person accomplished it and it's an inner accomplishment, but same as that individual was able to show us that there is no age limit. There is just age right now is a number. You just need to do what you can and do it at your pace and wow or you will be there for you whether you start it now or later it'll be there for you thank you so much Elda, for definitely sharing your wisdom and your journey with us we really thank you for that um, it, this has been a, a, a great experience, even for me and um, myself, Ray, and every everyone on here. Um, pretty much, we're always open at, to learning, right? Because we learn from each other. And just as we did this forum for you, we thank you for joining because we need this. <laughs> myself and Ray need this. Uh, we're parents of um, sickle cell warriors as well as advocates in the community, and we're always grasping to learn. So I just want to thank you, Nilda, and I thank um, Shirley for joining us also. Sh Shirley's one of um, those um, advocates that I have on my list of phenomenal um, women, um, phenomenal advocates in the community because she's taught us a lot just from her journey and um, just learning and seeing her just kind of inspires me as a mom and encourages me. So, and I must also mention that she um, was a former um, airline, <laughs> airline um, representative um, that used to travel a whole lot. So um, 
that just speaks to volumes to the limitations that you cannot put on yourself. Um, just allow, just know your body and understand what works best for you. Um, I want to just take the time to thank our partners as we close. And we thank them for their overall support. Again, we have Minnick USA, Bluebird Bio. Um, we also have Pharma Therapeutics and also Trumo Blood and Cell Technologies and also our supporter, which was Novartis. I, I highlight um, our supporters because it's so important to know who our supporters are and definitely in doing this work in the community to encourage and to provide programs, we're definitely appreciative and grateful of their support. I just also want to let you know that we are here and we will be having our next session October 2nd um, of 2020. Um, and then we will continue um, sessions for next year. We'll be planning those sessions, but our last session for 2020 will be October 2nd. So don't forget and join us. Also, you see the contact for myself and Ray that's on the screen. If you have any questions, you can always feel free to contact us. And always, um, as always, share the information because as we learn, we also um, learn to educate others and provide more resources for the community. So I just wanted to take the time to say thank you for joining us. I know we went over a little, but this was great information. I want to um, also thank our, our supporters that came on to learn with us. Thank you. And I will be mailing out those prizes. And we have um, support kits that we have been able to be in the, the greatness of our sponsors, being able to set out these support kits to our caregivers and, and patients and families that have joined these sessions. So, so just know you will be getting that also. So, and it has resourceful information in there, always education that we focus on and resources. So we'll have the resourceful information in there. We'll be mailed that as long as you registered, if you have any question, you can always confirm your um, address with me. Um, and my email is clewis at kidsconqueringscd.org. We want to make sure I have the information out to you. But those that are here, I do have um, took, took notes and we will be um, um, mailing out those packets to you. So you'll be seeing those in the mail and they are very cute. I won't tell you what's in them. I always like surprises, but they're very cute and um, very resourceful. So I thank you so much for joining us. And I want to just take this time to, to once again, thank our presenters. Have a blessed Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank everyone. You. I echo everything that Carla said. Thank you for joining us. It's a blessing. Thank you. Ladies. Thank you, ladies. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, Miss Lewis. <laughs>